Play ball. Play ball with Babe Ruth. Play ball with the Navy. The United States Navy brings you the adventures of Babe Ruth. And here to tell you about the fabulous and immortal Babe is his pal, the popular sports reporter, Steve Martin. Hello, everybody. Many of the things the big fella did, some of his most colorful feats, never got into the newspapers. But now they can be told. Right now, I'd like to tell you the inside story of a great young ball player named Dusty Cowan, who almost wrecked the Yankees, himself, and Babe Ruth. We'll bring you the exciting story of Dusty and the Babe in just a moment. But because I'm an old Navy man myself, an enlisted man in one war and a commander in another, and a sports writer in between, I know what Jackson Beck has to say to you will be highly important. So, come on in, Jack. Okay, Steve, and thanks. Here's something for all young men between the ages of 18 and 25 to think about. Is the high cost of living getting you down... Are you getting those civilian blues? If so, then switch to navy blues. When you wear the navy blue, you get good pay and three square meals a day. In the navy, you're secure. Every payday, sure. So if you're down, get up. Be on your way. See your navy recruiting officer today. Now here's Steve Martin again and the adventures of Babe Ruth. This is the story of the Babe and Dusty Cowan. Dusty wasn't his real name, of course, but by the time this program is over, you may be able to guess it. Dusty was one of the most talented rookies I ever saw, and the most hated. He was a hothead, a pop-off guy, and he lacked tact and humility. He was slated to go back to the bushes, but soon after the season opened... Two of the outfielders came up lame, and a few weeks later, Coombs sprained his ankle. Manager Huggins was pretty desperate when he told Dusty to take over center field, and I kept my fingers crossed that nobody would get killed. The Yankees were in a losing streak, and Dusty soothed their sore tempers like a red shirt soothes a bull. Detroit knocked them down three days in a row, and when I walked into the clubhouse, it was like walking into a grizzly den. Sanborn, who'd pitched that third game, was exchanging a few choice remarks with Dusty. And Babe was trying to... Your batters and make with your mouth, Dusty. We'd have won that game today. Go on, Sanborn. What you had on the ball, strictly nothing. You couldn't have beaten a kindergarten girl. Hey, cut it out, you guys. I gave him six hits. Just six hits. And twice you popped up with two men on. A bingle either time would have won for me. Who wants to win for you, you big jerk? Now listen, Dusty. Who are you calling a jerk? Wait, Sam. You were washed up ten years ago. Oh, yeah. Dusty, cut it out. Yeah. Try this on your piano. Uh, what? Hey, you hey, dirty. Hey, cut it out. Fight. Sanborn and Dusty tangle like a couple of spitting tomcats, with only the babe trying to separate them. The rest of the players yell for Sanborn to give Dusty his lumps. Then Sanborn tripped over a towel and went down on the concrete floor. When he sat up, his face was twisted in pain, and he was holding his arm. And that was when the little miller, all manager right, Huggins, walked in. what's all this about? Sanborn! What's the matter with your arm? What happened? This dirty Oh, uh, wait a minute, Sam. It was just a little accident, Hug. Accident? What do you mean, babe? Well, you know how it is. Dusty and San and I were sort of horsing around. San kind of slipped and fell. I thought you had more sense, babe. Haven't we had enough injuries this season, and now San? Holy cow, you guys will drive me nuts. Willie, get to work on Sands' arm. Come on, move. All right, all right. We're going to the New York AC, driver. Now, look here, babe. Why the deuce did you cover up for, for Dusty? We need him on the club, Steve. You need him like a hole in the head. That guy's a troublemaker. He's a great natural ball player, and he plays to win. Once he gets that chip off his shoulder... He, he... never will. It's a permanent growth. No, Steve. Dusty came up the hard way like I did, and a lot of other guys. He's had to fight his way every inch, and he kept on fighting when he got up to the Yankees. As soon as he finds out everybody isn't out to get him, he'll relax and he'll be okay. Not him, babe. No, he's a hothead. And... Oh, I was a hothead, too, when I first came up. 
but I cooled off and straightened out, Steve. And I've got a hunch Dusty will, too. It was no use arguing with the big fella. He was always a softy where youngsters were concerned. But I was afraid he would get into trouble if he stuck by Dusty Collin. And was I right? The next morning, all the papers headlined that Sanborn, the pitcher Dusty had tangled with, had dislocated his shoulder when he fell and would be out of action for a month. So when Dusty trotted out to center field that afternoon, the fans gave him the business. Especially one bull voice fella in the right field stand. The treatment got under Dusty's skin. He struck out twice, missed a shoestring catch in the seventh, and then banged smack into a double play. You should have heard the crowd roar then. It happened then, almost faster than you could watch it. Dusty, starting out to the field after he was thrown out, suddenly swung around and charged at the stands, making for the bull-voiced heckler. And as he jumped into a field box, the babe was right behind him. He grabbed the crazy mad kid and heaved him back onto the field. Then the babe himself fell into the howling crowd. When I could see the big fella again, Huggins, several of the players, and Big Bill, the umpire, were there. Going into the stands. Are you out of your mind, babe? I'm, I'm sorry, Hug. I lost my head, I guess. Some guy up here was riding me. They were riding, Dusty. And they were on me, too. I, I, I saw red. You mean you came up here to take a it's poke at a fan, you babe? That's right, no, Dusty. No, Bill, it was Dusty. It wasn't. Dusty tried to stop me. Get off the field. Oh, no, wait. Get off the field. Going into the stands is a serious offense. Not even you are big enough to get away with it, babe. I'm going to make a full report to the commissioner. The chances are, 100 to 1, you'll be suspended from baseball. Babe, you're crazy. Now listen to me, babe. There's nothing to say, Steve. There's plenty to say. The commissioner is considering your case now. He'd sure like to hang a year's suspension on you. Now you can't take a rap like that just to save Dusty Cowan's hide. I can take it. He can't, Steve. It would ruin him. It'll ruin you. Your name will be Mud. Oh, babe, for Pete's sake, use your head. Dusty isn't worth sacrificing yourself for. He's no good. He's got a lot of good stuff in him. He just got off on the wrong foot. Like I did when I broke in. He might have learned his lesson today. Are you kidding? If he had an ounce of decency in him, he wouldn't stand back and let you take this bum rat for him. Oh, babe, listen to me. Save your breath, Steve. Maybe you're right and I'm wrong. But I made my decision and I've got to see it through. That was a long, bad night for me, the big fellow's friends, and for his thousands of fans. The suspense was terrific by game time next day because the commissioner still hadn't handed down his decision. And I can tell you we were an anxious bunch of reporters up in the press box waiting for the bad news. We knew it had to be bad. I had my eye on the telegraph waiting for the flash from the commissioner when a big roar came up from the stands. Then I looked out and I swallowed my gum. Or the Yankees were going out to their positions. And Babe Ruth was trotting out to right field with Dusty Cowan jogging out to center. Well, the tip-off came on the third play when Collins of the Sox walloped one a mile into left center. Babe started back for it, but he was limping from that pile-up in the stands yesterday and it was evident he wasn't going to make it. And then while the fans were groaning, Dusty Cowan came racing out of deep center like a scared deer made a crazy leap into the air. He speared the ball with his gloved hand and crashed into the fence. But he was hanging on to that ball when the babe pulled him to his feet. A couple of minutes later, the second tip-off played itself out for us on the diamond. Sewell drew a walk. And then Dusty sliced a perfect shot between first and second on the hit-and-run play. And running like a deer, again, Dusty made it into second with a hair-raising slide. <laughs> Dusty was up on his feet at once. Not sullen the way he used to be, but brushing himself off and yelling at the big fella, who was walking into the batter's box by this time. You could hear him all over the stadium. Bring me around, babe! Look at the door, big boy! 
The big fella laughed and shook his fist at him, and then he took a toehold and blasted the first pitch high and far over the bleachers in center field. <laughs> While the fans went crazy, we reporters beat the dash record into the Yankee dugout. We still didn't know how come the Babe and Dusty were playing. Huggins was grinning from ear to ear when we grabbed him. Uh, what gives? What goes on here? Come on, give us the dope, Hug. How come the Babe and Dusty are playing? Well, Dusty came to me and Bill the umpire after the game yesterday and told us how he tried to go into the stands and how the big fella threw him out and then took the rap for him, just as I suspected. Dusty said that? That's right. I can't believe it. What did the commissioner say? He said he'd been snowed under with phone calls and telegrams from fans all over the country, begging him not to suspend the babe. And he decided, since nobody'd been hurt and there really hadn't been any trouble, to just find Babe and Dusty 500 bucks each and let them play today. Well, That's an you know. Oh, That's by the way, uh, how did you guys like the show those two put on this afternoon? Wonderful. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> really My friend Al Joseph says, you boys ain't seen nothing yet. Am I right, Dusty? Uh, if you say so, Babe. I mean... <laughs> Well, anything you say, babe. Anything. Well, I say this club is going to win the pennant. How about that, Mr. Popoff? Oh, you'll call it... <laughs> well, like I said, babe, anything you say. If you want the pennant, I'll personally get it for you. <laughs> you hear that, boys? <laughs> you hear my boy, Dusty? <laughs> this flag is in the bag. Well, just in case I hadn't known before what a real nice guy Babe Ruth was, I knew it then. But the big fellow was full of surprises, and he could always get into hot water right up to his neck. Before I tell you about the time the big fellow and I went hunting up in Minnesota with Dutch Reaver, the great Southpaw pitcher, I want you to know that we have a very distinguished guest aboard. He's Captain Gene Tunney, retired heavyweight champion and a fine Navy man besides. Gene Tunney was a Marine in the First World War, a private. And in the second, he was a captain in charge of the Navy's physical fitness program. Well, Gene, we're awfully glad you can be with us on the first of the adventures of Babe Ruth. Uh, well, Steve, thanks a lot. I can tell you that I wouldn't have missed being here for anything because I know what the Navy has meant to me and can mean to every young American. As you know, I have spent a good part of my life advocating clean living, both mental and physical. Yes, I do. And I think that I can say from my inspection trips around the world that the Navy really makes it easy for young fellows to be completely fit in both ways. That's right, Gene. I have seen baseball games in Alaska, football games on the equator, and boxing matches the world over. I know what... Navy food and Navy habits are, and I can tell you that I recommend it highly as a good way of life for America's young men. Thanks again for having me here on the first of the series you have built around Babe Ruth's life. He was a great athlete, a great competitor, and a great American. <laughs> Thank you very much, Captain Gene Tunney. I hope all you fellows realize that what Gene Tunney says is true. As an old Navy man myself, I know that the Navy offers living advantages and sport advantages and high adventure unequaled by any other career. If you're a high school graduate and are interested in the Navy as a way of life, contact your local recruiting office. <laughs> I was going to tell you about hunting with the babe in the deep north woods, but before we got out of that wilderness and afterwards, too, the babe's future and mine and Dutch Reaver's were all at stake. But that's next week's story. And a good one, too, if I know you, Steve Martin. Thanks, Jack. Well, so long, everybody. See you next week. This has been The Adventures of Babe Ruth, written by Ben Peter Freeman. Music by the United States Navy Band and produced by Woody Close. It has been presented by the United States Navy. The Fleischmann Peace Tower, presenting a variety entertainment directed by Rudy Valley. My 
time is your time. Your time is my time. I hope everybody, this is Rudy Valley and Company. I'm very proud of the company we have assembled for tonight's show. It comes closer, I think, to meeting our ideal requirements than any group we've brought together on this stage in recent months. For name value, news value, and performance value, we give you tonight Mr. Cole Porter, the man of the hour in the songwriting world, singing the song everyone is talking about, You're the Top, from Anything Goes, the biggest musical comedy hit of the year. William S. Hart, the well-beloved movie star of another day, emerges from retirement to be with us tonight. Miss June Walker, who will appear with Henry Fonda and Ralph Riggs in the current Broadway hit, The Farmer Takes a Wife, by Mark Connolly and Frank B. Elzer. Buck and Bubble, leading Negro comedy team on the current vaudeville stage. Miss Beatrice Lilly, who always finds a hearty welcome here whenever she returns from London. To sum up then, Jimmy, we have with us tonight Beatrice Lilly, Buck and Bubble, June Walker, Henry Fonda, and Ralph Riggs, William S. Hart, and Cole Porter. In our search for a title song to be used in the picture Sweet Music, which I've just completed, we had two sets of writers, each write a different composition. We found ourselves unable to decide which we preferred. As a result, the scene was photographed using both songs, but the final cut of the picture will contain the one which seems to be the preference of our audience at the Hollywood restaurant and those in our radio audiences who have already and who will express their choice. I wish you would write me which you prefer. Care of Warner Brothers, Hollywood, California. This is the first sweet music. A bit of simple philosophy as to the manner in which sweet music might bring together a pair of lovers who had quarreled and parted. We will play the second later in the program. Your decision will affect the final cut of the picture. Play on, play until the dawn. Music is the language of romance. Look behind the scenes, think what music means. No one is unhappy while he's dancing. Sweet music makes the rainy day seem clear again. It brings you near again to me. Sweet music makes a bitter word grow sweet again. So a heart can beat again in the harmony. We've learned to sing a song in spring, and yet if I forget it by December, will you remember? Sweet music makes the same old story new again. I bring to you again my song. Two more or less sentimental gentlemen from Georgia by way of Holland, Buck and Bubbles. They were in the Follies a few seasons back. Recently, they've been headlining with their own review unit in New York Movie Palace. Buck and Bubbles. Oh, hello, Bub. Uh, hello, Bubbles. Well, why, why are you so down on Well, you see, I tell you. You know, since this fellow Max Babb become champion of the world, my gal's gone crazy about prize fighters. Yeah. Boy, she told me she was going to marry nothing but a champion fighter. Oh, I see. You want to train to become a fighter, a champion. Oh, no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Oh, yes, you do. Yeah, well, how, how'd you guess? Because I'm going to manage you. I'll build you up as a fighter. I can see the whole picture. First, I'll have you fight some ham and eggs. Yeah, right away I get scrambled. No, sir. No, these fights are framed. We pay them to lay down. You lick them one after another. That gives you a reputation. Then you're ready for your big fight. How do you like that? Well, now, so, so long as you're only talking about it, could, couldn't the fight be over already? No, I see exactly what happened. You enter the arena. The crowd cheers. Then your opponent enters. Yeah, but who, who, who am I fighting? Who? Why, well, you're fighting there. What? I say you're fighting there. Well, look here, can I even wear pants? Oh, yeah. 
Boy, you don't understand. I mean, you're fighting Max Bear. Max Bear? Oh, no, I ain't either, brother. Goodbye, I'm gone. Too late to back out now. The bell rings for the first round. One, two, three. Bear comes running in the ring. Yeah, four, five, six. I goes running right out the ring. Oh, you stand up to him, and Bear just misses you with a terrific left. And what do you do? I grab myself a cake of flash my teeth. No, you go dancing around the ring. Uh-huh. Now he hits you in the teeth. Yeah, now my teeth dancing around the ring. Now he hits you in the puss and knocks you into your own corner. Now, wait a minute. Is, is this a prize fight, or is we playing puss in the corner? Now you cover up. Uh-huh. Bear faints with his right. He faints with his left. He hits you flush on the jaw. Yeah, then I faint. No, you you back away. Uh-huh. But are you downhearted? I'll say I is. No, no. You you come back for more. Come back for nothing. I'm satisfied with what I got. Say, Bub, Bub, tell me this. When, when did I hit him? Right now. You lead with your face. You hit him right on the glove. With my face? Yeah. Well, I bet that'll hurt him. You did hurt him. Bear's mad. He's fighting mad. He advances towards you with a murderous look in his eyes. Uh-huh. And what do you do? I'm going to start praying. No, no. You buck up to him. You give him the old one-two. The one-two? Yeah. What, what's that? You hit him once. He hit you twice. Uh-huh. He hit you again. Uh-huh. You're down. You're up. You're down. You're up. You're down. You're up. Yeah, now, wait a minute. Can I make up my mind? You're down. You're up. Look here. You, you, you cancel that last up, brother, because I stand down. I can see you getting up. Well, you got terrible eyesight. I stand down. Now you're up. You hurl yourself at him. He can't hurt us. Can't hurt us. Now you done got into the ring, huh? <laughs> Look here. Let, let me tell the story of the fight. First I hit him. He's down. One, two, three. Six, That's eight. enough. That's enough. Well, now he hit you. You're down. One, two, three, four, five. Now it's my turn again. I hit him. He's You've down. had enough. Now he's up. He hits you. You're down. Oh, no. He don't hit me. Yes, he hits you. No, he don't. Either he hit you or I hit you. You, you hit me. Yes, I hit you. Hey, how many guys am I fighting? Just just one. Just one. Yeah. Now the referee's counting. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. I can hardly bear it. Boy, is you suffering. Why, well, you're practically out. Yeah, well, well, when will I be back? But you're saved by the bell. Uh-huh. It's between rounds. Uh-huh. So I slapped you like this. Out. And like this. Out. And like this. Yeah, wait a minute. What are, you, what are you slapping me for? To revive you. Well, you quit that reviving me before I pass out. Say, look here. Bub, tell me, tell me what happens in the second round. Let's skip to the 15th round. No, I don't want to skip. I want to know what's going to happen in the next round. Well, if you just must know, Bear aims at you with the most terrific blow of the whole All fight. right, we'll skip, we'll skip. It's we'll the 15th skip. round now. You're covered with blood. Uh-huh. You've got two black eyes. Your jaw's broken and your nose is fractured. Yeah, now what have I got? you got a fractured nose, two black eyes, and your jaw's broken. Well, I know what to do now. What? Now, now's the time for strategy. Strategy? Uh-huh. What do you mean, strategy? Well, I grins at him to show he ain't hurting me. No, no, you're, you're battered and you're beaten, but you're going to show the stuff you're made of. Yeah, well, what's he going to do? Turn me inside out? Now, the crowd is yelling, stop it, stop it. Uh-huh. And what do you say? Now, that's okay by me. No, no, through Bruce's lips, you mama, come on, come on. I haven't even begun to fight yet. Yeah, but what round is this? The 15th. Boy, this is a heck of a time to begin. Now, Bears hit you so often, the crowd finds it monotonous. The crowd finds it monotonous? Yeah. Well, let them get in the ring. Bears so exhausted from hitting you, he can hardly stand. Poor fella, he, he can hardly stand. Look out, he's ready for the kill. What are you ready for? Uh, the Undertaker. I can't stand to see you take it anymore. You know what I'm going to do? Yeah, you're going to shut your eyes. No, I'm going to throw in the towel. Uh-huh. The fight's awarded to Bear, but you put up such a brave fight, you're going to get a reward. Yeah, I'm going to get a reward? Yeah. Don't cut my hair. Yeah, I-, I hope it's something nice. I'll say it's something nice. Yeah, well, what is it? A return match with Bear. Oh. Yeah, man. That's all that the serve at night. popular composition typical of the writers in the place where they write their songs this week happens to be I've got an invitation to a dance.
got an invitation to a dance But I don't think I'll go I'd be sorry, I know I'm afraid I might see the one who should be with me With somebody else I've got an invitation to a dance It's the town's big affair All our friends will be there They may talk when they see the one who should be with me With somebody else I don't want to start a lot of gossip Out of sight is out of mind Maybe there is still a chance to make up We may wake up and find We're leaving happiness behind I've got an invitation to a dance I could bring someone new But what good would that do? It would hurt me to see the one who should be with me with somebody else. Now, news and helpful information from Dr. R. E. Lee, Director of Weissman Health Research. Dr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Wallington. A good complexion is not only a social asset, it's a business asset as well. For a clear skin means good health, pure blood, and a body that is free from poisons. Clinical tests on hundreds of patients show that eating the new XR yeast clears the complexion in an amazingly high percentage of cases and in comparatively short time. These clinical results have been confirmed by thousands of people since this new yeast became available. Every day I receive letters from people who have quickly gotten rid of the ugly marks of poor health by eating Fleischmann's XR yeast. It is an entirely new strain of yeast, far stronger and much quicker acting. It normalizes your digestion and rids the body of waste. Your blood becomes purer, and instead of carrying poisons that irritate the skin, it brings pure nourishment that helps your skin make and keep itself well. To get the quick benefits, that Fleischmann's XR yeast can give you. You should eat it regularly, three cakes a day. You should soon not only have a clearer skin, but also feel a great deal better. Thank you. Temple, whose charm and innocence have completely captivated the entire world. She is appearing in a Fox picture called Bright Eyes, and of course, there is a spot for a musical composition which the publishers believe will prove very popular. The Stewart sisters bring it to you lyrically. The title, On the Good Ship, Lollipop.
presenting Miss June Walker in a scene from The Farmer Takes a Wife, Broadway's hit play by Frank B. Elser and Mark Connolly. Based on Rome Hall, a novel by Walter B. Edmund. The cast, June Walker as Molly, Henry Fonda as Dan, Ralph Riggs as Sam Weaver. Scene, the banks of the Erie Canal near Utica at dawn on a foggy morning in May 1853. The Farmer Takes a Wife is the charmingly naive love story of Dan Harrell, a farm boy, and Molly Larkins, a pretty young cook on an Erie Canal boat, or canal boat as canalers call them along the big ditch in the 50s. Dan takes work temporarily on Sam Weaver's boat, the Saucy Sound. In Rome, New York, he meets Molly Larkins, cook for Jotham Floor, the canal's best drinker and fighter. Dan thinks canaling can't compare with farming. Molly thinks life on the canal is the life for her. They quarrel, but they come to like each other very much before his boat leaves for Albany and her boat shoves off to Buffalo. As our curtain rises on a farthing, they meet again. Hello, Miss Larkin. When did you get in? Last night. Them your horses there? Yes, ma'am. That is Sam Weaver's. You good with horses? Yes, ma'am. Mostly, though, I admire cows. Say, where is everybody? In town, I guess, to see who won the lottery. What lottery? The Ohio drawing. It was supposed to be Monday. They ought to get the winner numbers by now. I heard it mentioned. The man selling for the Ohio lottery was in Rome that day I met you. But you wouldn't buy a ticket anyway, would you? I wouldn't be prone to, would you? No. My boater did. He bought six. Well, I wish him luck. Say, do you like cooking for him? Well, yes and no. I hear you ain't got a cook yet. No, ma'am. Mr. Weaver wants to get back the same woman he had. We've been taking turns. Can you cook? I've been frying a lot of steak. Would you like me to fix up some breakfast for you? No, I had about an hour ago. What'd you have? Steak. Do you think Mr. Weaver will get away early? Why? Is it so important? I got a letter from Mr. Butterfield in Port Byron the other day. It's about farming. He said I could see him in Utica today at 9 o'clock. You still got your plans, huh? Still going to buy that there farm? Yes, ma'am. I couldn't stand the farm. I got to be on the move. Wouldn't you like to have land all your own? The canal's all our own. <laughs> you ain't got a deed. My part's mine. I'd like to see anybody try to take it. I don't know. Some say the canal's done. Anyways, it ain't the whole of life. Ain't it? Well, to me, it is the whole of life. I love it. Things happen on the canal. There's boats coming and there's boats going, passing you all the while. All day long you hear their horns blowing, and like as not, there's a fight at every lock. There's all kinds of people, and they're going all the time. Naturally, you wouldn't like it, though, if you took such a frenzy for a farm. Well, I don't know. The canal just don't seem staple. I like the people on it. Of course, it's nice now with spring coming on. These last three days have been fine for planting. Oh! It was pretty yesterday morning coming down to Oneida. I sat out there on that chair in the sun and watched the birds coming north. Do you like flowers? Yes, ma'am. There certainly is a mess of violets and patty cutters this side of Rome. I had the urge to get off and get some. You ought to pick some of them elderberry blossoms and make some wine. I never made any wine. Voters don't like anything so weak as that. That is, real voters. Mr. Weaver used to drink wine for his stomach, but he give it up. Said it only aggravated him. He can certainly drink hard liquor. He can drink more than any two men on the canal, except one. He never met my boater. No, ma'am. He can drink more than any two men on the canal, plus Sam Weaver. Old Mr. Purcell, the bartender, just told me he's busted all records last night. Guess I better go and call him for breakfast now. Maybe he won't want any. You don't know him. He's a real canaler. Keepers, I can't understand a big, strong feller like you hankering for a farm. Well, I'll be going in and get breakfast. Hi, Dan. Dan Harrell. Hello, Mr. Weaver. Did you hear the news? I just won third prize in the Ohio lottery. Five thousand dollars. Jeepers. Yep, there it is. 
Ticket D2008. They just put up the official numbers in town. They're going to pay it off in Buffalo. I'm going there to, to get it Tuesday. $5,000? I couldn't believe my eyes. Sam, Sam Weaver. Molly, what's the matter? It's that there claw. I've stood just about enough of him. He's going to give me no lacing, and I ain't wiping no egg off his face. What's the egg doing now? I put it there. Said he wanted to sleep and didn't want no breakfast, and I said, all right, go sleep. He said he wasn't taking no orders from me, and he was going to give me a good lesson. What a dang fool I was to be proud he could drink so much. I ought to have flung the whole dozen eggs at him. Say, hey, you're mad, ain't you? But God, I'm getting to be. If I was you, I'd up and leave him. That's just what I'm going to do. I've never been ashamed of myself, and I ain't never going to be ashamed of nobody I work for. Why don't you sign up with us, Molly? You know we'd like to have you. Well, you said that too, Mr. Harrow, but... Mr. Weaver, you don't eat very much, and you know I love to cook. Well, this here young man ain't sick. He'll appreciate what you can do. Yes, ma'am. But you're going on a farm, ain't you? Well, that's been my resolve. Will the cooking be good there? Likely not. Do you like chicken pie? Yes, ma'am, I do. They tell me I make them pretty good. Mornings like this, do you like griddle cake? Yes, ma'am. I like them fine. Why don't you stay with Mr. Weaver a little longer? Well, that ain't the point. I wouldn't like nothing better than to have some of your cooking. And I might learn you how to make elderberry wine. But I'd never get anywhere on the canal. And I know a lot about a farm. I grab, I clean forgot to tell you. What? I won $5,000 in the Ohio drawing. You did? Yes, he did. I know just what I'm going to do. What? Take this here money and order me a 96-foot boat. I'll visit my married cousin in Durhamville and watch it get built. 150 tons. He'll be the finest vessel on the Grand Canal. Well, Sam, what about our cargo here? Oh, well, one of our owners will keep her working without me. Who'd you sell her to? I ain't sold her. I own half of her, Dan. And you own the other half. What? I bought this ticket the day I hired you. I had a feeling you was good luck for me. You're our captain beginning today. From now on, we divide what she makes. Stephen Stephen. Scotland, that's a fine present, Mr. Weaver. Maybe it'll encourage you to stay on the canal, son. Think of that. Twenty-three years old and you're half-owner of a boat. Gosh, I don't say it ain't handsome. Well, think it over, Dan. She's still a good vessel and we can make money with her. At the end of the year, if you still want a farm, you can go buy yourself one then. I could do that. Don't think I ain't grateful, Mr. Weaver. It's all right, son. Well, what do you say? I'll know in just a minute if you'll excuse me. Miss Larkin? Yes? Can I talk to you a minute, please? All right. This won't take long. Come on over here. You heard what Mr. Weaver just said. He's given me a half interest in the boat. Ain't that wonderful? Yes, ma'am. Are you quitting Clore? Yes. Well, then, will you marry me? What? It's about getting married. Yes, I know it is. You like me, don't you? Yes, ma'am, I've got to say I do. I like you the first time I see you. Well, that's how I feel. What do you think about it? I don't know. You're going to stay on the canal a while now, ain't you? Yes, ma'am, a while anyway. Well, I'll come and cook for you. All right. You don't want to get married now? Not yet. And we don't know. All right. It ain't part of my plan to make you unhappy. Well, I'm ready to go. My bag's all packed. Well, is that all you're taking? And this rocking chair, it belongs to me. I had it on my father's boat. Well, I'll set it back here on our boat. Wait, Dan. Put it on the bow end, Dan. Why? I want to keep my eyes open for elderberry blossoms. <laughs> Thank you.
I wish that we might give you our phonographed laughing version of this old favorite. The laughing version, however, is purely accidental and not likely to happen again. Therefore, we give you a very straight version of that old campus favorite, There's a Tavern in the Town, or as it is now called, The Drunkard Song. There is a tavern in the town, in the town. and there my true love sits him down, sits in him down, town. and drinks his wine as merry as can be, and never, never thinks of me. Fare thee well, for I must leave thee, do not let the parting grieve thee. Oh, the time has come for you and I to say goodbye, adieu, adieu, kind friends, adieu. Yes, adieu. I can no longer stay with you, fare thee well, oh, I'll hang my heart on a weeping willow tree, fare thee well, fare Fare thee well, fare thee well. He left me for the damsel dark. dark. Each Friday night they used to spark. spark. And now my love, who wants is true to me, takes that dark damsel on his knee. Fare thee well, for I must leave thee. Do not let the parting leave thee. Oh, the time has come for you and I to say goodbye at you. Adieu, kind friends, adieu. I can no longer stay with you. Stay with you. Oh, I'll hang my heart on a weeping willow tree. Fare thee well, fare thee well, fare thee well. And now I see him never more. Nevermore. He never knocks upon my door. I'm at all. with me, he penned a little note. I read to you the words he wrote. Fare thee well, for I must leave thee. Do not let the parting leave thee. All the time has come for you and I to say goodbye, adieu, adieu, kind friends, adieu. Yes, adieu. I can no longer stay with you. Stay with you. Oh, I'll hang my heart on a weeping willow tree. Fare thee well, fare thee well, fare thee well. Oh, Dick. My grave both wide and deep. Wide Put tombstones at my head and feet. And feet. And on the stone, just carve a turtle dove. To signify I died for love. Fare thee well, for I must leave thee. Do not let the parting be thee. All the time has come for you and I to say goodbye. Adieu, adieu, kind friends, adieu. Yes, adieu. I can no longer stay with you. Stay with you. Oh, I'll hang my heart on a weeping willow tree. Fairly well, fairly well, fairly well. Fairly well. W-E-A-F, New York. This is the Flight from East Hour, broadcast from the Variety Theater in Radio City under the direction of Rudy Valley. Rudy presents Buck and Bubble, June Walker, Henry Fonda, and Ralph Riggs, William S. Hart, Beatrice Lilly, and Cole Porter. From 50 million Frenchmen to the gay divorcee, the words, music, and lyrics by Cole Porter have appeared on many a theater program and many a hit song. His original melodies and his literate rhymes have, year after year, kept him close to the top position among popular composers. Right now, he's at the top. The reason? His sensationally brilliant score for Anything Goes, a show that has taken this show-crowded town by storm and placed Cole Porter squarely in the Broadway spotlight. He's here tonight in person to sing for us one song from the show, a number that perhaps represents his finest work to date, Mr. Cole Porter singing, You're the Top. Words poetic, I'm so pathetic that I always have found it best. Instead of getting them off my chest to let them rest unexpressed. I hate parading my serenading as I probably miss a ball. But if this city is not so pretty, at least it'll tell you how great you are. You're the top. You're the Coliseum. You're the top. You're the Lou Museum. You're a melody from a symphony by Strauss. You're a Bendel Bonnet, a Shakespeare Sonnet, you're Mickey Mouse. You're the night, you're the town of Pisa, you're the smile of 
on the Mona Lisa. I'm a worse check, a total wreck, a flop. But if, baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. You're the top. You're Mahatma Gandhi. You're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're the purple light of a summer night in Spain. You're the National Gallery. You're Garbo Sally. You're cellophane. You're sublime. You're a turkey dinner. You're the time of the Derby winner. I'm a toy balloon. The greatest doom to pop. But if, baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. You're the top. You're an arrow collar. You're the top. You're a Coolidge dollar. You're the nimble tread of the feet of Fred Astaire. You're an O'Neill drama. You're Whistler's mama. You're Camembert. You're a rose. You're Inferno's dante. You're the nose of the great Durante. I'm a lazy lout that's just about to stop. But if, baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. You're the top. You're the Swanee River. You're the top. You're a goose's liver. You're the boy who dares challenge Mrs. Bear's son, Max. You're the Russian ballet. You're Rudy Ballet. You're Fino Lack. Your romance, you're the steps of Russia, you're the pants on a Roxy Usher. I'm just in the way, as the French would say, de trop. But if baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top. Ten weeks ago, a new quicker-acting yeast was announced. Already more than three million people are eating this new Fleischmann's XR yeast. Every day, thousands more people begin to eat it. The reason is, it makes you begin to feel better and look better within just a few days. Listen to this experience reported by Mrs. E.M. Landis of Chicago, Illinois. Mrs. Landis writes, My face was a sight. I hated to be seen anywhere. Then I began eating Fleischmann's XR yeast. My skin improved in three or four days and cleared up after a few days more. XR yeast quickly cleanses the system of wastes and poisons and improves the digestion, as it did for Mr. J.W. Savage of Rockville, Maryland. Mr. Savage reports, I soon noticed improvement after eating XR yeast. After the second day, I stopped having indigestion. After the third day, my system was working right again. By the end of the week, I was full of energy and feeling great. Medical men everywhere hail the discovery of this new, faster-acting yeast. Here's a statement by Dr. Alexander Bruno, medical director and authority on public health. Dr. Bruno writes, Our patients, almost without exception, felt much better very soon after eating XR yeast regularly. They were stronger, had more appetite, and were free from headache. This new yeast acts more surely and quickly than former yeast in correcting digestive troubles and overcoming constipation. Don't put off trying this new, faster-acting yeast. Let it put your system into good running order. Just eat three cakes of Fleischmann's XR yeast every day. Keep on eating it until you're feeling entirely well again. Here's the second sweet music song, sweet music number two. It tells where sweet music might be found in the beauties of nature, the brook, the breeze, the seasons, and so forth. Compare it to number one, which we played at the beginning of tonight's program. If you feel so inclined, drop me a note at Warner Brothers, Hollywood, California, telling me which you prefer. Your letter will affect the final cut of the picture.
Our love song has no destination. It finds an inspiration and lives anew. My song of love was lost completely, but now it echoes sweetly because of you. Every brooklet that flows, every breeze as it blows, to your name they compose sweet music. In the autumn or spring, with the birds on the wing, all the world seems to sing sweet music. Oh, when the shadows appear, it keeps lingering near, for it reaches my on a moonbeam. It's a song of desire, and it never will tire. You were meant to inspire sweet music. We present, for one of his rare radio appearances, my very good friend, William S. Hart. To a whole generation of Americans, Bill Hart was an idol and an idea, a star above all other stars, the strong, silent man of the prairie. Not many of us know that his years of movie glory were preceded by a distinguished career on the speaking stage. He offers a dramatic recitation of his own poem, Tinto Ben. May I present William S. Hart. Eastern folks called it a tragedy story, and tragedy it rides hard on me. For I know Ben, that cow pony, and that pink nosed pinto knows me. The beef roundup cut out a thousand ahead, the craziest critters on the range. Five years old and beef to the hoofs to trail the billings and load on trains. That end didn't pan hard. We had the ponies and the men. Ever hear of the Chinook outfits? That's us. Big Dry, and Bar N, and Ben. <laughs> ben was boss of them all, so mild and gentle a thing. He could beat any outlaw, Helen, yet the pride of the wrangler's string. You loop my fowl on a pass, you might have brush in the way, but Ben would always save if they run on the rope all day. Why, Bill, our boss trail foreman, Segundo Jim, or any of the men couldn't drift in cattle quicker or eat a road brand better than Ben. <laughs> ben and me roped for money once. The saddle horn snapped with a cast, but Ben weavered in, missing every plunge till the saddle tree I got fast. Then he stood meek, his side still a-heaving, him apologizing like for the break. Didn't savvy watch us. He could only look with them eyes as big as a plate. But I was hugging him in a minute. We'd won out, out tied in 28, and for a little bucking and swelling of chest, <laughs> oh, say, son, you should see us pulling our freight. You can make talk of your solid colors, your bays and blacks are gray, but a 14-hand pinto for mine, and Ben was a king, work or play. Well, the range was way back, a rim of the sky, the train of belching blue smoke. Ahead, the city of bricks sticking high, where we'd be sure to go broke. Segundo Jim, a worry in a heap, me feeling like a loosened cinch, and Ben just trembling with fear was what was sent with a bunch. We was in a caboose and had nose paint and could buck up now and then, but that freight car wasn't no son of corral, and it sure was hard on Ben. <laughs> I told Ben folks get used to them cities, but there wasn't no harm, hard feeling in us parts. Milk Reaver seemed eight million miles from them there Chicago stockyards. A thousand cattle was signed for us not knowing where they was to go. Would Eastern men think less of dollars if they'd watched them cattle grow? We couldn't savvy their ways, didn't try to then. By and by, along comes a clerk feller saying, 
You're done when they're in the big pen. When I go back to that minute, the world seems to stand right still. We was to drive through a chute to the biggest pen, and the cattle was commencing to mill. Horns and hoofs was beating the air as they bellowed their fear-raging cries, while out of that bedlam and cloud of dust glared them frightened and bloodshot eyes. Jim and me's cussed many times since. Why didn't we tear out their throats? They didn't know range-bred cattle from a herd of mountain goats. A low-coat coyote called a man, trailed by a second and third, commenced shouting and waving their arms right at the back of the herd. Crack went Jim's 45 from the bank, and I yanked my smoke machine. The whole thousand head was coming like hell straight into that chute ravine. If I could only make a talk of the things that happened right then, I could tell of the greatest thing living, just a simple cow pony, Ben. As I touched the saddle, he was at him, as though just a prairie prank. No spur or tear in his belly, or quite a burn in his flank. He dashed and whirled at that maddened herd, while I fanned the old gun, but no use. On they come, crashing, ripping up earth, blind fury on hell, all turned loose. When I swung his head, he knew, and lengthened into that lightning stride. We could only live while out in the lead. Four lights was sure our death ride. God, what's that out in front? A gate! Iron found, rare and high, a screaming neigh, and Ben flattened, and I knowed he'd make it or die. Them lean muscles tightened, and he cleared it clean, as the scotch of them breath was behind. Hmm. Pardon? I'd cash in my checks without no deal, if another look from Ben I could find. When that sea of cattle stopped coming, they was piled up a mountain high. I sat in their blood, Ben's head in my lap, a listening to his last sigh. He was an ace, never whimpered once, though he knowed he was going to fail to go back to them plains where men live and breathe and that we must soon hit the back trail. Then, the greatest light I ever seed come into that, in those eyes, he pulled up them poor broken legs and tried to stand and, and die. Reckon some of that blood come out of my heart. This heart that Ben had won. So long, Ben. All in a day's work. So long. You son of a gun. Of 1935, I have selected what I think is the best of the four songs that are presented there nightly during the course of the floor show. This one by a West Point cadet who turns songwriter, Mike Cleary, and Dave Oppenheim, who writes as a hobby, being a millionaire owner of beauty parlors throughout the country. The song is called Out of a Clear Blue Sky. Made me realize life. 
life was an empty dream Till you came along on a sunbeam Out of a clear blue sky Sound the trumpet, sound the brasses for the entrance of London's pride and New York's joy. Miss Beatrice Lilly. At intervals during the past five years, this program has served as a welcome home for Miss Lilly, who sort of commutes between Broadway and Mayfair. Once more, we bow deeply in the direction of the wings and usher on stage Miss Beatrice Lilly. By special permission of the composer, who is grinning now off stage, Miss Lilly offers another Cole Porter song. The title, Thank You So Much. Mrs. Uh, Lowesboro, goodbye. Mrs. Lowesbury, good be. <laughs> Very well, Miss Mrs. Lowesbury, good be. Thank you so much, Mr. Lowesbury. Oh, Mr. Valley, sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Lowesbury, good be, gives weekends. And her weekends are not a success. But she asks you so often, you finally soften and end by answering yes. When I met Mrs. Lowsbury could be, the letter I wrote was polite. But it would have been bliss had I dared write her this. The letter I wanted to write. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. Lowsbury could be. Oh, thank you so much. I'll thank you so much for that infinite weekend with you. I'll thank you a lot, Mrs. Lowsbury Goody. Thank you a lot. And don't be surprised if you suddenly should be quietly shocked. For that clinging perfume of that damp little room. For those cocktails so hot and the bar that was not for those guests so amusing and mentally bracing who talked about racing and racing and racing for the tall mane I got from your famous cold clamor and the fortune I lost when you taught me back gammon for the mornings I spent with your dear but deaf mother and the evening I passed with that Founder, your brother, and for making me swear to myself there and then, never to go for a weekend again. Hmm, thank you so much, Mrs. Lowes, for a good deal. Oh, thank you, thank you, too much. My request, Miss Lily is going to sing for us now a number that just about broke up or really did break up our show on another occasion. It's an impression of an English music hall artist rendering an American song with a way down south side. Partners of an action, please. <laughs> Oh, 
this old banjo All in the Caribbean Sleepy river on the sleepy shore Get me one seat in the hind the cabin door. The place is so crowded, got to sleep on the floor. When it's sleepy time, ooh, ooh, a down in sleepy town, ooh, ooh, a down in sleepy south, down, down, ooh. Come here, honey. War at your sister, Ellie Mae. Ellie Mae done run off to Atlanta. Nigh on to five years ago, Pappy. So she did. So she did. War at your sister, Bessie Mae. Bessie Mae done took herself off to Louisville, Pappy. Two years ago, come Derby Day. So she did. So she did. And little Susie Mae, my baby. War at my little Susie Mae. God, my me, Governor. <laughs> little Susie Mae done shuffle off to Buffalo. Oh, she did. Oh, she did. Seems like there ain't nobody left but just you and your mama, honey child. Don't y'all remember, Tabby? Mammy done fell down the well this morning. <laughs> Mammy got grounded, Tabby. So oh, she did. So oh, she did. We'll have to get your mam out of that well, honey child. Yes, Kathy. Yes, sir. We'll have to get your mam out of that there uh, well. <laughs> One of these days. Sleepy river on the sleepy shore. If you won't sit behind the cabin door. Oh, the place is so crowded. Got to sleep on the floor. Oh, when it's sleepy time. No, no, no. Down in sleepy south. No, no, no. Down in sleepy town. Down, down. That's me. Happy, happy. Boom! Cotton, cotton. Just enough. Sleepy, sleepy. Mammy, later. Here's something that's happening all over the country, hundreds of times every day. Why, Mary, you look marvelous, simply wonderful. Well, I certainly feel a lot better. I've never seen such a quick change in a person. I saw you Sunday and you actually looked ill. And here, four days later, you look like a million dollars. I know, Jane. I can hardly believe it myself. It seems like this, that I've set three million people to eating the new XR yeast already. In just a few days, this new Fleischmann yeast brings improvement in your appearance that your friends can see and a great improvement in the way you feel. This new, faster-acting yeast quickly reconditions your digestive tract. It strengthens the digestive muscles from the stomach on down. It speeds up slow-flowing digestive juices. You soon get a better appetite and should be able to eat without getting indigestion. After a few days, you can quit taking cathartic. Waste and poisons are cleared out. Skin eruptions go away. You are freer of headaches, 
and have much more pep and energy. Also, you're much less likely to have colds because XR yeast supplies you with anti-infective vitamin A in addition to vitamins B, D, and G. Give yourself the benefit of this wonderful food. Begin tomorrow to eat three cakes of Fleischmann's XR yeast every day. You can get it at grocers, restaurants, and soda fountains. Sweet music makes the rainy day seem clear again. It brings you near to me. Sweet music makes the bitter word grow sweet again. So a heart can beat again in harmony. We've learned to sing a song in spring and yet if I forget it by December, will you remember? Sweet music makes the same old story new again. I bring to you again my song. Every brooklet that blows, every breeze as it blows, to your name they compose the sweet music in the autumn or spring with the birds on the wing all the world seems to sing sweet music next week another interesting flight now with an all star cast this is Rudy Valley bidding you all good night This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Hall of Fame, presented by Heinz Honey and Almond Cream. Tonight, the Hall of Fame brings you Walt Disney and his gang. Yes, they're all here. Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Hello. Hello. The Three Little Pigs. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Pluto the Pup. Woo, woo, woo. Clara Cluck. <laughs> Donald Duck. <laughs> and all the others. And here's the original Silly Symphony Orchestra in a medley of Silly Symphony tunes featuring the voices of the original characters. First, the three little pigs and the song which swept the world.
Here's Mia Levy from the Grasshopper and the Ants. Now the good book says the Lord provides. There's food on every tree. <laughs> I see no reason to worry and work. No, sir. Not me. Oh, the world owes me a living. The world owes me a living. <laughs> you should soil your Sunday pions like those other foolish ions. Come on, let's ploy them. Sing them dions. <laughs> Lullaby Land. say, who's afraid of the big bad wind? Who's afraid of the old hard water? Who's afraid of pots and pans, dishes, mops and brooms? Wind, weather, housework. Defy them with Heinz Honey and Almond Creek. No matter how windy or cold the weather gets, or how much housework you have to do, you'll never have to worry about rough, red, chapped hands again if you use Heinz regularly. It's almost magical the way Heinz makes raw, sore hands stop hurting and starts right in to heal the most painful cracks. Let the children use Heinz on their chapped faces and hands and on their red, raw knees when they come in out of the cold. Heinz eases the drawn, dry feeling that makes the skin burn when children come indoors. You know when children's hands are rough and chapped, dirt gets ground in, and the skin looks grimy no matter how thoroughly it's scrubbed. But if their hands are softened and healed by Heinz, it will save a lot of unnecessary suffering, and they'll be easier to keep clean. Hand lotion pads come and go, but for 60 years, women have looked upon Heinz as the one dependable protection against chatter, the tried and proved way to keep hands smooth and lovely, even in the bitterest weather. For in addition to its healing balms, Heinz also contains cosmetic ingredients, which beautify the skin and keep it young-looking. And now, it is my privilege to introduce the personality behind all of the world-beloved Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphony. Ladies and gentlemen, Walt Disney. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. Whoa! Thanks, gang. Hello, everybody. 
How'd you like to be the father of my family at Christmas time? I mean, did you ever try to pick out a Christmas necktie for a horse? <laughs> or rubber boots for a young duck? <laughs> Don't worry, Donald. You'll get your boots. <laughs> Bless his heart. Well, we'll hear from him later in the program. <laughs> oh, Donald. Nice, not yet. Nice little fellow. Now, our program tonight is to be a surprise party. It's the gang's Christmas present for... Donald, put it down. I told you not to bring that pop gun to the studio. Yes, you, and don't point it at people. <laughs> boys will be boys. Yes, the gang has gotten up the entire program by themselves. They've named it quite appropriately the Christmas stocking. And each one of them has put a surprise for us, Donald, in the stock. Don put it down. <laughs> Donald, don't point that gun at Clara Clark. <laughs> Why, if it went off accidentally, you'd, you'd hit her. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> Give it to him, Clara. <laughs> you bet she wants to fight. Sing him, Clara. <laughs> Let him up, Clara. You win. That's enough. <laughs> you, you got just what you deserve. Shame on you. And if you hit anyone else with that gun, I'll break it right over my knee. Yes. Donald, give me that gun. Give it here. So you don't think I meant it. Well, I'll show you. There, let that be a lesson to you. And from now on, I want you to be a good duck. Say, Mr. Disney to you, Donald. Donald, just one more word out of you and I'll call the boogeyman. How? Why, I'll just clap my hands three times and they'll pop right out at you. Okay, I warned you. Here goes. We are the boogie, boogie, boogie men. We will get you, get you if we can. When we come out into the night, baby's always waking with a fright. I guess we got rid of Donald Duck for a while. And now, Miss Minnie Mouse will take the first surprise from our Christmas stocking. Here she is. <laughs> Donald, where'd you come from? Well, what do you want now? No, Donald, not now. Wait for your turn. Donald, give me those bells. Oh, I don't want to fight. But if I hear any more out of you, I'll sell you back to Joe Penner. Well, there goes Donald, and here comes Minnie. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Merry Christmas. Minnie, I hear you have a big surprise for us in the Christmas stocking. Uh-huh. Open your mouth and shut your eyes. Oh, no, not with Donald in the studio. Just tell us what the big surprise is. <laughs> it's my two little birds, Jenny Wren and Kirk Robin. Are they going to sing for us? Uh-huh. <laughs> Minnie's going to play the violin while her two birds, Cock Robin and Jenny Wren, sing the love duet from their new silly symphony, Who Killed Cock Robin? And I might mention that this is our first mystery thriller. We defy you to guess who killed him. In fact, if you even suspect who killed Cock Robin, we'll give you, well, we'll give you Donald Duck. All ready, Minnie? Uh-huh. Wait till I give my birds a kiss. Sound your right, Jenny Wren. Oh, no, no. Higher, Jenny, higher. <laughs> That's right, precious. Come on, Cock Robin. Hop up on Minnie's violin. Get your pitch. Listen. Oh, that's perfect. All right. <laughs>
splendid, Minnie. I'm sure your little birds will be a sensation on the screen. Oh, thank you, Rob. And while we're on the subject of pictures, I suppose you know that from now on, all of Mickey's pictures will be in Technicolor. <laughs> Well, Mickey's pants be red. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I think it's about time his face was red, too. Let's get him up here to the microphone. All right. Yoo-hoo. Oh, Mickey. Come on and bring your pig. Okay, Minnie. Uh, Suey, Suey, Suey. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I got a surprise. Minnie's birds are okay, but I got something better than that. Wait till you... <laughs> hey, you hear my singing pig. <laughs> First, I got to get him in pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good enough. <laughs> we ain't so particular, Minnie. Presenting Mr. and Mrs. Patty Pink. Mickey, that was beautiful. Oh, he ain't heard nothing. Hand me that bucket of frogs, Minnie. Huh? Here it is. Oh, Mickey. <laughs> She's afraid of frogs. I'll catch them. I got one. Hold them, Walt. Yeah. <laughs> Steady, boy. <laughs> is there a blotter in the house? Hey, where's my tree frog? <laughs> Here he is, Mickey. <laughs> Thanks, Goofy. Introducing the Mill Pond Brothers. Purple, purple, and purple. <laughs> Must have been something yet. <laughs> well, here they are. But let's see what the orchestra can do with a brand new tune called Heidi Hades from a silly symphony, The Goddess of Spring. Wow. 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 Wow.
Leonora stops. She sees one of her lovers approaching. It is Manrico, the Duke of Lysol. Leonora greets Manrico. Other lover, Don Pedico. <laughs> Shoving Manrico aside, Don Pedico pours out his heart. Words lead to blows. The lovers draw their swords. They come together. It is a battle to the death. <laughs> Enrico and Don Pebico both fall to the ground, mortally wounded. Leonora rushes to the ground beside them. She realized that she has lost both her lovers. So she takes out a vial of poison and drinks it. <laughs> then she tries to revive the lovers so they can all die together. She bathes their wounds with Heinz honey and almond cream. They open their eyes. They see fair Leonora sinking to the ground. She is breathing her last. Her heart is pounding. All three are dead, but they struggle to their feet and sing as they have never sung before. She was trying so hard to reach that high note, and she laid an egg.
Hall of Fame joins Walt Disney and his gang in wishing you all a merry, merry Christmas. We hope you've enjoyed this broadcast of Mickey Mouse and the other famous Disney characters. Screenland Magazine is offering prizes in a contest of letters telling why you like Mickey Mouse. You'll find all of the details of the contest in the February issue of Screenland Magazine, which is now on the newsstands. <laughs> The Hall of Fame is presented by the makers of Heinz Honey and Almond Cream, which throughout the bitterest weather keeps hard-working hands smooth and comfortable, lovely to look at and thrilling to touch. Next week, the Hall of Fame brings a return engagement of those two celebrated personalities of the screen, Charlie Ruggles and Mary Bowler. The Hall of Fame has come to you from the NBC studios in Hollywood. John McIntyre speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with Who Cares? Last night, I read an interesting advertisement by a tire company telling car owners how to take better care of their tires to make them last. This seemed to me to be very helpful advertising, and it suggested to me to make sure that every car owner also knows how easily he can take better care of the finish of his automobile with Johnson's Car New. Cleaning and polishing a car used to be a big job, one of those all-day or at least half-day affairs. But Car New has done away with most of that hard work. Because Carnew both cleans and polishes in one application. Two jobs at once in quick time. Carnew is a liquid polish. You massage it lightly over the car finish, let it dry, wipe it off. It cleans amazingly, brings back your car's original showroom shine. If you want added protection for that gleaming finish, if you want to save money on car washings, you can apply a coat of wax, too. But first, do a double cleaning and polishing job with Johnson's Carnew. Spell C A R N U. Take Me Out to the Ball Game used to be a very popular song, particularly with Mrs. McGee of 79 Wistful Vista, who at this very moment is singing the old refrain to her husband as we meet Fibber McGee and Molly. Mrs. McGee, why don't you want to take me out to the ball game? It's the opening game of the season today, and I love baseball. But Molly, I called up and the park is sold out. Oh, what of it? A man of your influence? Huh? You always said you could get in any place you wanted to one way or another. Oh, I can, too. Oh, I can get in all right, but I wouldn't ask you to smuggle yourself into the ballpark in a beer truck. <laughs> oh, McGee, come on. What are you president of the Chamber of Commerce for if you can't even get tickets to a ball game? Tickets? Me? Go to a ball game on a ticket? Why not? If I can't get in on a pass, I won't go. <laughs> Only the common people buy tickets. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a common people, and I want to see that ball game. No, oh, gee whiz, Molly, I don't quite see how McGee, I McGee, can... I'm challenging you. You are, huh? Yes, I am. Okay, you're as good as in. Where do you want to sit? Well, it doesn't matter. I stand up all the time anyway. <laughs> I can holler better that way. Now, how do we get in? Oh, I don't know. The details ain't important, but we'll be there. Don't worry. McGee, at times like this, I almost admire you. Well, how do you think I got where I am today? <laughs> If I didn't have imagination and stamina. I don't know. Where are you? Say, <laughs> look, you better get busy now. The game's this afternoon, you know. Yeah. And I hope Zernike pitches. Who? Zernike. You know, the southpaw that Wistful Vista bought for $3,000 and a shortstop from the Akron Acnes, and who spent four years in the minors trying to straighten out his fast drop. <laughs> you know Zernike. <laughs> I'm afraid I haven't followed the game as close as you, Molly. 
Miss uh, Zernike is pretty good, eh? Good. Why, he's a sidewinding sensation. Huh? He's got a curve that would fool a slow-motion camera, and he steals bases like the Invisible Man. He's 29 years old, and he has a batting average of 367. Born in Zanesville, Ohio, and has a small mole on his left shoulder. <laughs> What was his grandmother's maiden name? Princess Purple Prairie Dog. <laughs> she was an Indian girl. <laughs> you, you seem to be kind of up on your baseball, Molly. Well, I ought to be. I've been following baseball ever since I was old enough to throw a pop bottle. <laughs> Remember before we were married, dearie? If that's Judge Landis wanting some information, what'll I tell him? <laughs> tell him he rang the right bell. Okay. Come in. Oh, it's Mrs. Uppington. Hello, Abigail. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. McGee? And Miss McGee. Well, what's new, Mrs. Hughes? <laughs> well, I just stopped by to see if you could use a couple of tickets to the baseball game. I'm so busy I won't be able to go, so I thought you might use oh. them. Oh, heavenly days. Thank you, Abigail. Yeah, what did I tell you, Molly? There's a power that watches over me. Yes. <laughs> you see, Uppy, I promised Molly I'd get her into the game today, and when you came along and give us tickets for that... Well, uh, these tickets are for Thursday's game, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Uh, what power is watching over you today? <laughs> Think fast, mastermind. I'll go under my own power today. <laughs> Why can't you go to the game, Abigail? Oh, nice club work, you know, Mrs. McGee. We have a guest for luncheon today who is going to talk to us about China. Oh, that ought to be interesting. Oh, sure, fascinating. How you gals can sit there, Uppy, and listen to a lot of verbal about how to paint forget-me-nots on cups and saucers when there's so much going on in the world today oh, is beyond... Oh, please, Mr. McGee. Huh? As usual, you have taken a running jump to an incorrect conclusion. <laughs> Our guest is not speaking about cups and saucers. Oh. He represents the United China Relief, for which our organization is helping to raise a very necessary $7 million fund. Hmm. You'd better blush, McGee. Oh, I'm not sorry, Uppy. <laughs> While I've got my neck out, would you mind looking to see if I need a haircut? <laughs> uh, you do. Thanks. <laughs> Say, what about this United China Relief, Abigail? Well, Mrs. McGee... China didn't want this war any more than we did. No. It was forced upon both of us. America and China are fighting the same gangster nations for the same ideals. Peace and honor and personal freedom. But China has been fighting our fight for five years, and now they need help. They need seven million dollars urgently for civilian morale, medical and food supplies. And I think it's up to us to help by subscribing generously to the United China Relief. We owe it to them. As we owe certain things to Japan, and I think they will both be paid for the time. Well, now, don't you feel just a little sheepish, dearie? I sure do. If I felt any more sheepish, I'd rent myself out to jump over fences for people with insomnia. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know she was doing such good work. Indeed she is. She's doing a lot. You know, she gives five days a week to the Red Cross, one day to canteen work, and she's bought $40,000 worth of United States War Savings Bond. Mm. I think I felt proud when I turned in that old toothpaste tube last night. <laughs> well, it just goes to show one never can tell from where one sits how wrinkled one's pants are going to look when one stands up. <laughs>
are we going to sit? You sit on the Davenport, and I'll sit in the big chair here. I like to sit here because the ashtray is no, always right No, I, in... I don't mean where are we going to sit here. I mean out of the ballroom. Oh, oh, yes, the ballroom. Well, there's no rush. We've still got two hours, and we can get there in 20 minutes. Yeah, but it may take us an hour to find a hole in the fence. <laughs> what do you mean, a hole in the fence? I says I'd get you into the ball game, and by the 40 flutes of the Philadelphia Philharmonic, I'll get you into the ball game. <laughs> now, just take it easy, Molly. I'm not... Come in. Hello there, kids. I brought you something. What? Much obliged, old-timer, but what is it? Sack of alfalfa. Huh? The Ferillion baby. <laughs> I didn't think you'd want to ride or a silver cup with these missiles, huh? So I'll bring him this. Well, thank you, Mr. Old-timer. This is very thoughtful of you. How's the kid doing? Well, it's going to be a fine horse when he grows up. <laughs> Might make a racehorse out of it. Good for you, Johnny. Leave me known, I'll help you train. Oh, do you know something about training race horses, Mr. Oldtimer? Do either of you kids? No. No? Yes, sir, I sure do. <laughs> you know that all the big race horses have a mascot that lives in the stable with them, a dog or a cat or goat or rooster or something? Oh, yes, I've heard that. Well, I was a mascot for a horse named Chester's Baby down in Louisville. Lived right there in the stable with him. Hmm. How'd you ever get a job like that? Well, I was just a stable boy at first, Johnny. Yeah. Then the owner seen he needed a mascot, so he told the trainer, grab that old goat over there and put him in the stall. <laughs> trainer was nearsighted and grabbed me. <laughs> Natural mistake. I wanted to be it then. <laughs> Quite a career, Mr. Oldtimer. Roommate for a race horse, huh? We were more than roommates, daughter. We were sidekicks. <laughs> He'd kick me in the back and I'd kick him in the side. <laughs> Learn to eat hay, old timer? Nope. Two tickly feet it in a bunch and one straw at a time don't give enough nourishment. <laughs> I'm like you, Johnny. I stick to the old corn. <laughs> <laughs> well, call me if you need a good trainer. <laughs> By the way, dearie, uh, did you go out and feed Lillian and her baby? Sure, and you know what? That colt understands Chinese. Go on. Yeah. What are you talking about? That horse is a, as American as baked beans. I don't care. He knows Chinese. I was trying to think of a good name for him this morning, so I thought I'd try a few. And the one that got the best reaction was going to be the name. And what was the name? Well, sir, I tried Alfred and Homer and William and Bert and Paul and Cecil and Leonard and Sidney and all stuff like that there. So I was a little horse myself. <laughs> And all they'd do is Lillian would look at the colt, and the colt would look at Lillian, and they'd kind of shake their heads. So I got disgusted and says, ah, phooey. And they both started squealing. <laughs> I tell you, that horse is Chinese. Oh, God. Well, this isn't getting us to the ball game. Now, don't forget to promise you take... Hello, folks. Am I intruding? Oh, not a bit, Mr. Wilcox, not a bit. No, I was just getting ready to take Molly to the ball game. Oh, are you a fan, Molly? Well, <laughs> yes, in a way, Mr. Wilcox. In a way? <laughs> Say, I'll bet she could tell you who the leading pitcher was in 1905. What lead? American. Rue Waddell, Athletics, 127, lost 10. <laughs> See? Why, that's wonderful, Molly. You know, I used to play a little baseball myself. Did you really, Miss Wilcox? Uh, what did you bat? Right-handed. He means your batting average, Wilcox. See, even I know that. Oh, well, I never figured it out. I pitched for the salesman's team of the Johnson Company back in Racine, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Been a big help to me ever since, too. Oh, Mr. Wilcox. Oh, Molly. You, <laughs> you shouldn't have asked that. Why not? Why, that's the same as giving Lillian a handful of hay to keep for you overnight. <laughs> but it's too late now. Why, Mr. Wilcox, did your baseball experience help you later on? <laughs> Well, I'm still on the home team, you know. Still in there pitching. Oh, telling housewives they'll never get to first base with old-fashioned methods of rubbing and scrubbing linoleum. See what I meant, Molly? Yeah. Why, a short stop at your dealer's for a can of Johnson self-polishing glow coat will result in a home run with efficiency and economy. You can just see Pop fly home to get a look at that oh. gorgeous kitchen floor. <laughs> gleaming like a diamond. With no rubbing and no buffing, you'll get your innings with more outings. Because glow coat saves you so much time and energy. Pitch your old mop tail out the window, girls, oh. and get some Johnson's glow coat right off the bat. <laughs> Listen to old Gabby Hartnett Wilcox. <laughs> All the baseball he ever played was for a handful of salesmen. <laughs> Didn't you ever try the big leagues, Mr. Wilcox? Yes, once, but I quit after one season. What for? Well, the club started playing night games, and I never was one to play around in nightclubs. 
Well, I'll see you later. Ooh. Say, why didn't you ask him what he could do towards getting us into the game this afternoon, McGee? Uh, he hasn't got any drag, except with housewives. <laughs> if I wanted a piece of sponge cake or something, I'd go to him. But for ball games and stuff, we got to contact the sporting element. Now, let me see. I think a better way for us... Uh-oh. Come in. Oh, hello, Mayor Latrivia. Hi, Latriv. I'm glad you are here. <laughs> Good day, Mr. McGee. Oh, why are you glad, McGee? I wanted to talk to you about the ball game. You see, well, I... that's odd. I'm on my way out there very shortly, and oh. it's getting so much warmer. I wondered if you'd mind if I left my top coat here. I don't like to leave it in my car. Oh, of course, Mr. Mayor. Are you a baseball fan? Oh, uh, not much, I'm afraid. The last game I saw in Chicago in about 1919. I remember that because it was my birthday, June 17th. Ah, uh, June 17th, 1919. Then you saw Frankie Frisch. I did? Of course you did. That was his first major league game. McGraw sent him in in the ninth inning to bat for Hal Kane against Grover Cleveland Alexander. Pastor was playing center field for Chicago. Good heavens, <laughs> woman. How do you remember all that? Why, everybody knows that. Ain't she wonderful, the trivia? Who won the World Series in 1912, Molly? Boston. Boston four games, New York three games, one tie game. <laughs> Amazing. It's no such a thing, really. <laughs> I just take an interest in the game, though. Didn't you ever play baseball in college, Mr. Fitz? No, I was a more inclined toward mental work, indeed. You see, I specialized in lists. In what? A list. You were? All the time? <laughs> were what? Lit. Of course not. Lit is merely the abbreviation for literature. Just the same. I should think you'd have to have a clear head for that kind of work. I did. I did, that's... Well, how could you? Lit all the time. I was not lit all the time. I was a very obtenious young man. Well, I should think you would be with all those professors around. Can you catch on? Catch on to what? You know, you being lit. <laughs> I tell you that lit stands for literature. Yes, but the literary guys stand for you being lit. Can't you get it through your head, McGee? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What was that for? I promised myself. Next time we got into one of these things, I told myself I would not give way to anger. Besides, I have a mission to perform this afternoon. And I wish to present as cheerful a face as public to the public. I mean, I wish to present as cheerful... What's the mission, Mr. Mayor? As mayor, I have to throw out the first ball. I thought you never played baseball. That's correct. I never did. You know how to throw, Mr. Latrivia? Oh, I fancy I shall make out all right, Mrs. McGee. One just raises one's arm like this, and... No, 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 no. no. Look, Latrivia. Stand sideways, like this. Then wind up a little. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Uh, McGee, where are you going? I'm going to find my baseball and catcher's mitt. Then I'm going to take Latrivia out in the backyard and show him how to toss the baseball. I ain't going to have our mayor disgrace himself out there at the ballpark. Oh, really, McGee? I, well, this is very decent of you, I'm sure. Not at all, not at all. We ought to whistle business. Did you find your ball, dearie? No, but I think I know right where it is. Where? Right here in the hall closet. <laughs> My, my, don't things accumulate fast? <laughs> the King's Men and Blues in the Night. My mammy done told me when I was in knee pan. My mammy done told me. Oh, a woman of sweet talk and give you the big eye. But when that sweet talk is done, a woman's a two-faced, a worrisome thing who leave you to sing the blues in my mind. Oh, 
Atlantic to Mobile, from Memphis to St. Joe, wherever the four winds may blow. Oh, I've been to some big town, yes, sir. and heard me some big talk. He said, but there is one thing I know, a woman's a two-faced, a worrisome thing who leaves you to sing the blues. Oh, in my mind, my mammy done for me. Oh, and brother, I tell you, so help me, I got the blues in my heart. Okay, Latrivia, you're kept on pretty good. Now throw me a fast one. All right, McGee. Here it comes. Ah, that's better, much better. How's he doing, Molly? I don't know why you're keeping him at it, dearie. He does all right, and the poor man's too tired. He can hardly stand up. Ah, it's good time. Uh, how you feeling, little trivia? Uh, pretty tired, me. Oh. Uh, haven't you got another catch of mitt? <laughs> I fall pretty hard. My hand's getting blistered. It's hard to close it. <laughs> Gee, I'm sorry, Latrivia. This is the only mitt I got. <laughs> anyway, a politician who can't close his hand might be a very good thing. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Here she comes. McGee, now you can throw better than that. You didn't come anywhere near him. He's had to shag every one of those throws. I know, I know. I'm limbering him up. Yeah. Oh, don't, huh? McGee. There's Uncle Dennis upstairs in the window. He's been watching you and the mayor. Yeah, look at him, licking his chops. What's that for? Those last three Latrivia toss were highball. <laughs> okay, Latrivia. Let me have another one now. And remember what I've been telling you. Wind up. Uh, like this? Yeah. Only don't raise your hand like you were going to slap somebody's sassy face. Swing your arm out more to the side. Oh, well, I'll try it again. I'm getting very tired. Oh. Come on now, Mr. Mayor. Right over the plate. What plate? Never mind, never mind. Just throw it, Latrivia. And remember the instructions. Wind up, throw your left leg up for balance, bring your arm way back, and then kind of push the ball at me. Ready? Ready. Ah, that's much better, Latrivia. Much better. You can put your left leg down again now. Throw the ball back to me, and I'll try it again. Here it comes. Say, your catch is pretty good, McGee, considering he does it with his eyes shut. Well, I ain't through it in yet. Okay, Latrivia. Ready? I'd like to rest No, no, no. Keep swinging that arm. You don't want to get cooled off. Come on now. Try it again. Well, you ready, McGee? Shoot the spear to me, dear. <laughs> now, that was very good. It was, really? Yes, it was, Mr. Trivia. I only had to run seven or eight feet for that one. At least you'll be able to keep the ball in the ballpark. Now, let's try it another 15 or 20 minutes, and then I think oh, we can... Oh, look, McGee. Huh? Here comes Mr. Wimple. Maybe you'd better rest a few minutes, Mr. Mayor. Oh, thank you. Good heavens, I hadn't realized that baseball is such a strength with him. I'm just about... Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Wimple. Hello, Kate. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Wimple. Want to play a little ball with us for a while, Wimple? Oh, no, thank you. I really had all the baseball I wanted yesterday. <laughs> Stevie Face's brother was over at our house, and they were playing catch with you. Oh. Did you use a hard ball like this one, Mr. Wimple? Oh, they didn't use the ball. They were playing catch with me. Heavenly <laughs> days, that must have been fairly rough, Mr. Wimple. I didn't mind, Mr. McGee. But when Cyrus, that's Stevie Face's girl, when Cyrus suggested that you get a bat and knock a few flies to Stevie Face's cat, I just ran like the dickens. <laughs> you ever meet Sweetie Face, Mr. Wimple? No, I don't believe I ever have. I don't believe she goes out much. Uh, does she, Mr. Wimple? Oh, yes, quite a bit. In fact, a sweetie face loves to get out and mangle with people. You mean mingle. Oh, I do, do I? <laughs> <clears throat> this, uh, this wife of yours must be quite a character, Mr. Wimble. She really is, Mr. Mayor. Oh, now, let's not all talk about her like that. She isn't so bad. She even feels terrible after she treats me badly. She does? Oh, yes, indeed. Why, just this morning, she was down on her knees to me, just begging. Oh, not really. Really, Mrs. McGee. Down on her knees with a flat iron, just begging me to come out from under the house. <laughs> <laughs> I won't interrupt you any longer. I have to be getting down to jail. Jail? Sure. What you going to jail for, Wimp? I'm going to be locked up. 
I called him and told him I was coming. Oh, but what on earth did you do? Mm, I just slugged Stevie Face with a baseball bat. <laughs> Good heavens, man. Did you hurt her? No, that's why I want to be locked up. <laughs> Mr. Latrivia? Well, I'd rather not, if you don't mind, though I really do appreciate this, McGee. It was very sporting of you. Oh, not at all, Mr. Mayor. Here, now. Here's your coat. Oh, thank you. I... No, no, no. Oh, oh. What's the matter, Latrivia? My right arm. I can't raise it up. Oh, <laughs> it's just a little stiff, Mr. Mayor. Try again. Here, I'll hold the sleeve of your coat for you. Now. No, no, no. No, no, it's no use, Mr. McGee. I can't lift that arm in. McGee? Huh? I can't go. I'm too lame. I'm sore all over my arm, my leg. I've got to get to a doctor. Will you do something for me? What is it, Mr. Mayor? Why, just name it, Latrivia. I'll do anything on account of I feel kind of responsible for this. I hate to ask you to do this. Will you represent me at the game today and throw out the first ball? Oh, now, gee whiz. Just because I'm president of the Chamber of Commerce, you... Well, all right. I'll do it. You got a pass to the ballpark or something? Yes, yes. It's right here in my... Oh, <laughs> You, you get it. I already got it, the trivia, and it's for a whole box, I see, so I'll take mine. Yes, yes, yes. Take it, take anybody. Yeah. Now, help me out of my car, will you? I, I don't believe I can walk uh, alone. I'm sorry, Mr. Trivia. I ain't got time now. I just got time to get out to the ballpark. Now, come on, Molly. Let's hurry. But McGee, poor Mayor Latrivia. Is... No, go, go on, Mrs. McGee. I'll be all right. Yeah, come on, Molly. But take McGee. That. You wanted to get out to the ball game, didn't you? I told you I'd get you in, didn't I? Well, come on. So long, Mr. Trivia. Take it easy. No. <laughs> Last time you were in the kitchen, did you happen to notice the floor? Was it clean and sparkling and cheerful, or was it a little on the dull and gloomy side? You know, it's so easy to take care of your linoleum floors with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. It's as simple as this. Just apply and let dry. Glow coat polishes itself while it's drying without any rubbing or buffing. And did you know that linoleum protected regularly with glow coat will last five to ten times longer than if it's unprotected? With all of us looking for opportunities to save and ways to take better care of our things, it's good judgment to protect all linoleum surfaces with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Be sure to get the original and genuine glow coat. Enjoying the game, Molly? Oh, I certainly am, McGee. But you know I keep worrying about Mayor Latrivia. Ah, oh, he's all right. I know now why you spend all that time teaching him how to throw a ball underhanded. Overhand. It was underhand. It... <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Well, I thought you would because... Here it comes, there, McGee. Slam it out of the park. <laughs> Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for the home and industry, inviting you all to join us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is Chicago WMAQ. Ipana toothpaste and Salopatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, Salopatica for the smile of health. Fun with our star comedian Fred Allen and his mighty Allen art players, Peter Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours, the Town Hall Quartet, and the flock of new anxious and eager amateurs. New voices, new music, new fun. It's Town Hall tonight. <laughs> Listen to that crowd. They're cheering in the streets as Fred Allen leads his weekly parade to the old town hall. Fred's laughing and joking with the gang, the band's playing. And here come the mighty Allen I players. Let's join the merry throng. Everybody's going. Here they come, aliens. But you can't stay in America without a passport, Giuseppe. Please support. Support the Giuseppe tomorrow. It's the town hall of tonight. Hillbillies. What you doing with that rifle, Ma? Aiming to become a widow? No, there's a toe tap on the radio, Paul. It's town hall tonight. 
into his bulletproof vest and addressing the crowd. Let's listen. If I had the wings of an angel, through these town hall doors I would fly, folks. But you're just as welcome on foot. So go right in, friends, if you'll Happy kindly. Good evening, Alan. Hi there, Brother Crawl. How's the old steeplejack these days? I ain't getting rich, but I'm living high. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you can be grounded for a crack like that. Line forms to the right. Hurry, please. Hello there, Mrs. Dodd. Evening, Mr. Allen. Is your show funny tonight? Ha uh-huh. ha, you roll in the aisles, Mrs. D. Lord, now I'm wearing my Sunday dress. I hope you're close, please. Go right in and strap yourself to a seat. Hurry, 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 hurry. We're ready and willing, Captain. Uh, okay, Harry. Tell Peter I'm opening with rise and shine. Okay, let her go, Pete. <laughs> that cosmic colossus of Cyclopean caricature and comedy, Fred Allen in person. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, before putting out our flag and auctioning off the fun, I'll read you the town hall bulletin for tonight. Hodge White at the corner store is calling the attention of you kiddies, attention kiddies, to his new peppermint spitball, now on display at the candy counter. It's a delicious peppermint ball that tastes swell on the way to school, and when you get there, kiddies, there's a nice, big, hard wad of cardboard inside the candy you can throw at teacher. So much for good, clean, peppermint-flavored fun, and now for the town hall new. After this terrific pace I've set, uh, don't you think we should have a letdown, Harry? Yes, Fred. Uh, I'll let down the picture sheet right away. Thank you. <laughs> Before they missed Moses, what had happened, Harry? Somebody turned out the lights. Here they go. The projector starts, and we bring you the latest news of the week. The town hall news sees nothing, shows all. Washington, D.C. Government prepares to open training school for landlords. Students will be taught landlord's duties and then employed on new government housing projects. Town Hall News shows how government-trained landlords will probably greet tenants on rent days. The scene, any home. Mrs. Please? Yeah, and I don't want any. Oh, I'm not selling anything. Oh, well, come in. Now, don't let no air get in. My husband's a bouncer at a nightclub. This fresh air will kill him. Oh, excuse me. I'll shut the door. Nice little apartment you got here. Oh, it's all right. The bathtub's a little too small to hold coal. Well, those two rooms look comfortable. They're made rooms. They're closets. Closets with no doors? Yeah, firewood's been expensive lately. We've been burning the doors. Oh, well, I'll make a note. Using doors in the furnace. No, just in the stove. We're burning the kitchen stairs in the furnace. Well, the the windows are all right, I hope. Yeah, but my husband had to take out the glass on account of the flies. Everybody on the street looks freckled. Well, I, I've got some good news for you, Mrs. Fleece. I'm going to fix up your apartment as good as new. Who are you, Santa Claus? No, I'm your new landlord. Landlord, I knew it. That's what I get for talking to strangers. Wait till I call me husband. Hey, Francis, friend! Yeah, what's up? Hey, who's the gigolo? Well, uh, I'm the new landlord, Mr. Fleece. You ain't no landlord. Where's your dispossessed? No, no, honest, I'm a landlord. 
I, I just graduated from landlord school. Look, here's my diploma. Come on, scram, Pont Leroy. Grab him, friend, before he mentions rent. No, wait, wait. You don't have to worry about rent with me, Mrs. Fleece. I'm a government landlord. You mean we ain't got to pay? Why, of course not. I'll send a memo to the H-O-A-X. The homeowners ain't exchanged. Don't tell me the government sends us to go. Exactly. Why, great. When we get it, we can move out of this joint into a better neighborhood. New York City, New York. Cornell students who are studying to be hotel executives run Ho Hotel McAlpin for one day. Town Hall News shows how average hotel might seem if it were run in true collegiate style. First, the guest, Mr. Jones, applies for a room. Uh, clerk. Yes, sir? I'd like to get a room. What are your rates? Sis and sis. Boom and boom. It's four a day for a single room. We rent them cheaper by the hour, a dollar with tub and two with shower. Well, I'll take a room with a sponge. Yes, sir. Register, please. <laughs> Front, bellboys. We're, We're here, here to please and, and take your grip. grip. The, the bellboys bell here is sit. Hip, hip, hip. Show Mr. Jones the 609. Rock, rock, rock. J-O-N-E-S, Jones. Skin is skin and bones are bones. It's 609 for Mr. Jones. <laughs> Signal, 906. 069. Take it, Jones. Right through the line. Here's your bag, Jones, old friend. Where do I go? Around oh, left end. He made it! Yay, Jones! After a hectic stay, Mr. Jones finally checks out. Leaving, Mr. Jones? Yep, I'm all in. Well, did you like our college boy service? No. Give me my bill. I'm raw, raw, raw. You smashed my bag and broke my jaw. Bring it here. Alakazam, get out of my way. I'm going to scram. Touch it, touch it, touch it. Brooklyn, New York. County court judge rules that married women have legal right to steal from husbands' pants pockets. Town Hall News interviews inventor Mr. Tita B. Humpty, who has perfected pair of safety trousers for married men. Oh, come right in. I'm Mrs. Humpty. Glad to know you, Mrs. Humpty. Mr. Humpty's right in here. Where is it, Maud? I'm from the Town Hall News. Eh? You call for shoes? He's a little deep, Mr. Allen. Oh, it's about your new invention. Which one? The steam radiator for bird cages? No, no, your new safety trousers for married men. Men's pants. Oh, ants. Ants in your pants, huh? Well, try red pepper. No, he means your pink poop trousers. Your pink poop trousers with the big Ben pocket. Oh, yes, yes, I made these pants for my own use. Well, how do you uh, protect your money in them? Well, I got a mousetrap built right here into the pocket. You hide the money under the trap. Oh, what's this little string here? That connects with a sky rocket. The rocket hid in the leg of the pants. That's right. The string's got a match on the end, and it sets off the rocket. Great idea. Now, as the sky rocket shoots off up the pants leg, it rings a bell sewed in the seat of the pants. Oh, can you demonstrate it? Yeah, sure. Put your money in here, and I'll set the trap. Now, I'll hang your pants on the chair. Now, put your hand in, Maud, and show them how it works. All right. I reach in the pocket for the money, and the finger goes in the mouse trap. Oh! Stand back. Look out for the sky rocket. Hey, that's a lot of noise. What's the big idea? Well, it wakes me up. I jump right out of bed and beat the stuffing out of the wife. Once again, the Town Hall News brings you the outstanding sound of the week. Island of Guam, Trans-Pacific Air Mail Plane, China Clipper, start last leg of 8,000-mile journey. The China Clipper. You like hair cut short on top or a boyish bar? <laughs> Say, Fred, while you still have that screen down, would you like to hear one of my candid movie camera shots? Candid movie camera? What's oh. that? Something uh, with a lens shaped like a keyhole? Oh, well, maybe. Let's listen to this domestic scene and see. Oh, well, for heaven's sake. This newspaper doesn't print the strangest thing. What is it now, Mary? Oh, it's one of these don't believe it if you don't want to columns. Listen, it, it says that some of the people in the Ukraine, to be sure their pizza look good, look up at the new moon, say three prayers take a clod of earth from under their right heel, and then rub their teeth with it. They say it's a magic way to clean their teeth. Ah, poor Ukrainians. <laughs> yes. Didn't anybody ever tell them about Ipana? 
Well, it seems not, but I'd like to. For while there's nothing magic about the reason for using Ipana, there's something almost magic about what it does for your teeth and your gums. If your teeth are dull and dingy, Ipana will make them whiter and brighter. If your gums are soft and tender, Ipana with massage will help to stimulate and strengthen them. Now, we're living in an age of reason, ladies and gentlemen, and the reason for so many white, sparkling teeth is Ipana. If you aren't already one of its thousands of users, won't you be one of the next to try it? The familiar red and yellow striped tube can be found in any drugstore, and once you've used it, I think you'll always remember Ipana for the smile of beauty. Peter Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours. And now, ladies and gentlemen, an ultra announcement. On Saturday, the Married Ladies Bridge Club will rough it socially and switch to an evening of stud poker. On Friday after... Oh, quiet, 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 please. If that's some nature lover trying out a few bird calls, I'll be down and give you the bird to go with them in just a minute. Hello. Well, sir, as, <laughs> as I live and wear low collars, because an Adam's apple a day will keep the throat doctor away, if it isn't Portland. Yes, I'm going down to the cat and pet show to meet Papa, so I thought I'd stop in. What's Papa doing at a pet show? He's too old to be going in for that sort of thing, isn't he? Well, somebody sent him a ticket. It said, cat show, admit one. So Papa took Mama. Did your mother go as an onlooker or as an entry? Papa didn't say. He just told Mama not to wear her fur coat. Really? <laughs> what kind of a fur coat is it? A uh, by the wee sable? No, Papa says it's unborn mohair. I've never heard of unborn mohair. <laughs> Neither have I, but it's expensive. Papa says there's only a little hair on the mow, and it takes a lot of mows to make a coat. A lot of mows to make... Presley is nice. It's practically necking for money. <laughs> Papa should have been a wrestler. They'd never pin his shoulders to the mat. You mean he's so sticky? No, he's so round-shouldered. And you're round-shouldered mentally, if you know what I mean. I know. You mean it's about time I was leaving. That's right. You saved me the trouble of coining an insult. Oh, I'm not going yet. Well, well. Oh, well, Fred. Oh, well, 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 I have four young white on step in a white hot tonight. Well, well, this is Mr. Allen. Hiya, Hillbilly. <laughs> What do you mean, hillbilly? You don't see any guitar marks on my stomach, do you? Uh, you ain't kidding me, Elmer. You're corny enough to draw clothes. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Waldo. Little boy should be seen and not heard. Why, that little runt? I'll fold him up like a ten-cent road map. Uh, you and what civic body? Another crack like that, and I'll fold those big ears over your face like an envelope. Now, stop it, Waldo. Let him go. Let him go. I'll follow him around until he grows up. And then I'll let him have it. <laughs> you do, and I'll kick your sins till you think you're wearing woodpeckers 
the garden. <laughs> if I knew you'd gotten so tough, Waldo, I wouldn't have asked you that. I wish he was my boy. I'd paddle him through childhood like a canoe. Yeah. <laughs> Say, if you think I'm tough, you ought to see Pa. Is your father a ruffian too, Waldo? Is he? Why, Pa's got so much iron in his system, if he ever gets caught in the rain, he'll rust. <laughs> Well, I hate to intrude, but my great-grandfather was the first soldier to bite the frost back at Valley Forge. <laughs> Why, that's nothing. If my grandfather had replaced his divots when he played golf out west, there'd be no Grand Canyon today. <laughs> How is the family on your mother's side, Urchin? Ah, oh, we're all tough. None of us was brought by the stork. Our family used a buzzard. <laughs> Gosh, what were you raised on, buttermilk? Oh, buttermilk was a luxury. Pa used to throw a can of condensed milk and a cold sizzle in my cradle, and I had to get along the best way I could. Well, my folks threw me into a cow barn, and I took it up from there. <laughs> How old are you, Waldo? I'm 12. As years ago, I've lived a dirty dust. If you're, if you're going on 13, it may be unlucky for you to hang around here, son. Call in your tall a tongue, Corn said. Your lower lip looks like a delicatessen counter. <laughs> well, if you two are going to keep hurling effortless, I may as well go. Yes, women and children first. You two can leave in that order. Not so fast, stupid. What about my audition? What audition? I thought you were here looking for an argument. No, Walter wanted to show you his Christmas present, Mr. Allen. Yeah, Ma did a Christmas shop on her. I got a clarinet. Look at this. How does she sound, Waldo? <laughs> what are you trying to play? Squeak to squeak? Why, I am just warming up, wise guy. Where do I get my E flat perfect? <laughs> That's what you think, the rest of it. <laughs> Don't say it, Mr. Allen. We get the idea. Well, well, what do you want me to play, folks? Play possum for about an hour, will you? <laughs> oh, that's well. I've got a feeling you're fooling. Yes, but he's all wet. If I've got a feeling he's drooling as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Why, you and the boys, like yeah, 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 that's what you yeah, and you too, boy, just to tell me, yeah, 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 yeah. You oh, you yeah. no, stop right in the middle of a concert, Waldo. What concert? What concert? Why, you broken down MC? I ought to bust this over your head and make two piccolos. <laughs> <laughs> Don't flag your clarinet, Waldo, it's valuable, isn't it? Well, I'll tell the world. Why, 200 wouldn't buy this musical bean blower. And I'm one of the 200, if it's any good. <laughs> That's done it. That's done it. I wouldn't take that from Rubinoff. I'll say. <laughs> I've insulted, too. Let's go, Waldo. So long, Waldo. Goodbye, Portland. Howie, ho! <laughs> And now the town hall quartet comes from the alley up to the stage to sing one of their vocal flip-flops. She was an acrobat's daughter. <laughs> she was an acrobat's daughter. Her folks were the bounding muggies. She turned 21 and married the son of the man on the flying trapeze. Oh, the wedding was held in the circus For all the spectators to see And when they were with, they both stood on their head An acrobat's daughter was she She could do a backflip, a front flip With real acrobatic grace A nip up, a trip up Without landing on her face She could do contortion With portions of without her well anatomy She'd wonder by thunder just how this could ever be. Oh, she was an acrobat's daughter. And although they were married a year, why each and every morning they'd rise and just for a little exercise, why they'd swing from the old chandelier. Oh, they turned summer coffee for breakfast. 
and three go to be fourteen. When bedtime drew near, they both stood on their ear. And Acrobat's daughter was she. Ooh, ooh, ah, oh, she was an Acrobat's daughter. And her pep, there are little train <laughs> She taught them some tricks, then gave five or six to the man on the flying trapeze. Oh, dressed up in her tight trimmed with spangles, she looked just as cute as could be. She feared they might care. Oh, my face red. So she carried a spare. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I see the boys are lowering the picture sheet again and switching out the light. I'm as much in the dark as you are. What is it, Harry? It's the football newsreel, Fred. Really? Well, as the cook said when she cut an apple in two, let's help it. <laughs> what a football game, folks. Here only a half minute left to play. State trailing by three points, and how those boys are fighting. It's fourth down now, only a yard to go for a touchdown. This is the match round. And I can hardly... Help! Darling, stop sneezing and keep your eye on the ball. Oh, Look. Jack, what's going to happen? Oh, I don't know. Look, and there goes the play. Help! Oh, Jack, what happened? Gee, God, didn't you see that touchdown? Oh, no, darn it. I sneezed and missed it. Help! Well, now, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that none of you will leave a football game tomorrow with victory in your heart, but the beginning of a cold in your head. If you do, will you take my advice and nip that cold in the bud? And don't do it in some hit or miss fashion, but do it scientifically. With rest, plenty of liquid, a careful diet, and sal hepatica. For you see, when you have a cold, there are usually these two conditions you must get after right away. First, waste in your system. Right. Waste, spreading poisons throughout your body. And second, too much acid in your system. Right again. And that acidity always aggravates cold. So take this simple tip. It's worth its weight in health. Put two teaspoonfuls of salopatica in a glass of water and drink it. Because unlike ordinary laxatives, which do only one thing, salopatica does two. It both rids your body of waste and combats acidity. It's the mineral salt laxative you can always depend on for those two necessary actions. And you'll always find it gentle, quick, and thorough. Keep a bottle in your medicine cabinet, and at the very first sign of a cold, remember salopatica. For the smile of health. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the Mighty Allen Art Players. And to make this a real Thanksgiving, they will not present a Thanksgiving playlist. Tonight, rather, they offer that beard-raising melodrama of darkest Russia entitled Whoopi on the Volga. Or they drank and drank until they bored. Overture, Petrovich. <laughs> My darling, my sonny boy. You are stopping? I'm stopping. Well, sleep already. That papa will come home, and mama will gonna give you a nice supper. Look, this caviar is good, no? No. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, you want mama to sing for her little darling? Yes, mommy, sir. Sing to me a song, sir. All right. So put on the head. So. Yankel Doodle went up town, rising on the grocery. Yankel Doodle. Open up. I am opening up. Ah, oh, Nikolai, my darling, it's you. Ah, uh, it's me. Do you still love me, Sonia? Of course I love you, you silly Billy. Ah, uh, it's good to be back again. Is your husband home? No, no, not yet, but I'm expecting him. You'd better keep me quick and go here. So jealous. And for why? For Nyati. I will kiss you and go. Yes, my love. Kiss me and go. Yes, I will kiss you and go. Kiss her and go already. 
Open up, open up. Oh, your husband may be quick hiding in No, no, no. No, no I would let you out the back way. Here, quick, pull this door. Go, my lord. I go without kissing you. Open up, open up. Darling, kiss me. You still love me? Of course I love you. But tell me, who are you? Remember? <laughs> remember little Misha what used to go to night school with you? Little Misha with the red hair? Right, Toot. Rusty Misha. Oh, yeah, yeah, Little Rusty Misha. Yep, that's the one. I'm his Uncle Jake. Jake from America. Sonja from Nizhny Novgorod. Aha! No wonder you are talking with an English accent. Oh, look at you, an American boy. A young Kaldudu Bandit. You your brat, Sonia? Yes, sir. That's my baby. No, sir. Don't need maybe. Oh, so you're married. And how? Sure, Sterling. Put down the hat and go to sleep. Okay, Mommy, sir. Tough little mug, ain't he? But is he smart? He heard you talking with that English accent, and already he was talking just like you. A regular genius. Hey, listen, what's that? No, oh, probably Major Bowles jumping around outside there. <laughs> Just the village bells, I guess, out for a good time. Why, it's stopping here. So what? Maybe it's my husband. He's jealous, something terrible, especially a foreigner. Who's a foreigner? My people came over on the Potemkin. <laughs> Let him in. If I meet him face to face, he'll get the worst of it. Okay. All right, but don't talk with an English accent. Tell him you are Russian school teacher. You are giving my boy laughs. School teacher, what'll I do? Sing to him. Oh, you. Oh, you. Well? You're remembering me? I am your husband. Oh, yes. Come in, Gregor. Aha! There's a snake in the wood pile. Sure. You're waking up my class. Class? What kind of class? I am the boy's tutor. His tutor, huh? Tutor. Well, toot, toot, tutor, goodbye. <laughs> I am going to kill you. Stop, Gregor. Don't be so hasty. Wait five minutes. <laughs> Don't you talk to me, you double timer. Well, slunk, comrade. I got a feeling I'm catching a sleigh ride. Hey! <laughs> you're not getting away so easy. Is that so? You know to whom you are talking to whom? To whom? To me. Oh. <laughs> now, listen, big boy. Don't be so jealous. Your wife is true blue oval in the yard bird. How can you even suspect me, Gregor? Let him go. Wait, I got an idea. This man is talking with a foreign accent. What are you going to do, my little dog? I'm going to wake up the baby and listen to him talking. So what will be if baby's talking? Is this a trick? <laughs> when this baby is talking, he is imitating everybody what is visiting here. Then I will find in God who is visiting my wife behind my back. No, Gregor, it's not nice to wake up the baby. Stand back, I will wake him up. Coochie, coochie, darling. <laughs> Get who here. Look, Vladimir Bublitsky. It's your papa. <laughs> I think so. Don't cry, my little man. You had a busy day, no? Tell papa. You had company today? Good morning, okay. Good shiver me timbers. Now take it, no wash it. <laughs> And now, before I bring the first of tonight's promising amateurs to the microphone, I'd like to introduce a man who, tomorrow, Thanksgiving Day, is going to commit the perfect crime, Harry Von Zell. Well, now, Fred, it's, uh, it's not exactly a crime, and it isn't exactly perfect. I see, but outside of that, I was pretty accurate, huh? Yes, now, here's what I mean, Fred. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day. Yes, it is. And I know that when I sit down to murder that turkey dinner, I probably won't leave the table until I've stuffed myself fuller than the turkey. And I know I'll have plenty of company. There are only two things wrong with you. Two things brought on by your holiday overindulgence. Poisonous waste in your body and too much acid in your system. And you can remedy those things very quickly and very easily. 
Just put two teaspoonfuls of salopatica in a glass of water and drink it as soon as you get up. Because salopatica does not just one, but two things. It both rids your body of those poisonous wastes and combats that acidity. And you'll certainly be thankful to salopatica when you're feeling your normal self again. Remember salopatica for the smile of health. Ladies and gentlemen, Town Hall tonight continues immediately after your station announcement. folks, and the song you've just heard was I'd Love to Take Orders from You, played by Peter Van Steeden and the Ipana Troubadours, and sung by the Town Hall Quartet. And now here comes Fred Allen leading a new group of eager amateurs out on the stage for tonight's big amateur contest. Thank you. Before I forget it, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that thanks a million is staying for third week at the Radio Center Theater and opens tomorrow, Thanksgiving Day, at the Fox Theater in Philadelphia. Thanks a million is that picture that stars Dick Powell and shows for the first time on any screen a radio man named Fred Allen. You may have heard of him. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here we are with boys and girls who may be the stars of tomorrow. Ready, one and all, to compete for our first prize of $50 in cash and a week's engagement at the Roxy Theater in New York City. And a second prize of $25 in cash. The winners will be selected by you folks here in town hall. Your applause will be registered on the John's Manville applause machine here on the stage, and the three acts receiving the highest ratings will be called back later so that you may select your final winner. Now, first tonight, I have the honor to present Bill Hausler. Bill has come over from Jackson Heights tonight as sort of uh, a, a, a dare. Uh, before going any farther, I should explain that Mr. Hausler is one of our NBC expert photographers. Is that right, Bill? Right, correct. You admit it, huh? <laughs> I, uh, How could I contradict you? Well, uh, I was just going to say that I went down to have some uh, photographs made about two weeks ago, and Bill told me that as a sideline, he was operating a small harmonica. So I dared him to come up here some Wednesday night, and here he is. How does it feel to be a radio actor, Bill? I'd rather be on the other end of the camera. The other end of the camera? Yeah. I don't know. A photographer's uh, uh, life seems so futile to me. A young fella giving the best years of his life in the dark room alone like that. I mean, after all... <laughs> uh, they, uh, they tell me that you're quite a candid camera expert, too. Is that right? I told you that. Yes, I hear it. <clears throat> I'm not taking any chances anymore. No, I just was wondering, what is the purpose of the candid camera? To make people look as funny as they do. Oh, naturally, huh? I should have an awful time with me, wouldn't you? Yes. In other words, if an actor has a toupee, the candid cameraman tries to sneak around when he's got it off and catch him with his hair down. Right, right. right. Well, what are you going to play for us, William, on your mouth organ? I'm falling in love with someone. I'm fa I'll get out of the way so I won't confuse you. Thank you.
Bill Howes of Jackson Heights. Thank you, Bill. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have you meet Miss Camille Jekyll. How do you pronounce your name, please? Jekyll. And what is your first name? Camille. Oh, I didn't know whether it was Camille or Camille. Those names are confusing. Sometimes you use the, uh, the liquid L as an alphabet soup. <laughs> and other times it, uh, like it would be Camille as in walk a mile for it, you know? <laughs> That's, uh, it's an odd name, isn't it? What is your nationality? Do you mind? No, I'm Hungarian. Oh, are you really? Hungarian? Really? Uh, Hungary must be a beautiful country. Were you born there? Well, no. Oh, you weren't? No. Well, you've heard about it, surely. Yes, certainly. I, uh, <laughs> I should have. I, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, uh, Hungary, after all, the Danube flows through Hungary, doesn't it? The beautiful blue Danube. That's like Old Man River in Technicolor, isn't it? <laughs> I, I know I, I've always uh, enjoyed that waltz, Mr. Strauss's beautiful Blue Danube. Is it? <laughs> oh, that's another river, isn't it? I, it's so confusing, all those songs named after rivers. Mississippi, Old Man River, Swanee River, and that new one now, Creek to Creek. It's come a new one now. I beg your pardon. Oh, is that a, a Hungarian song, is it? And what did you say it was again? All right, thank you. Amikesi, <laughs> of Jackson Heights. And now, again from Jackson Heights, that's three from Jackson Heights. There isn't an excursion running in tonight, is there? <laughs> now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in tonight, is <laughs> Ladies and Tommy, using Fred uh, has an army. Using Jim told me that you were quite an athlete just a short time back. Is that right? You played football? Yes, baseball, too? Well, more or less. Just football? Football, basketball, basketball. Oh, swimming. I used to be quite a famous swimmer. If I had a little water here with me now, I'd show you a high dive, but unfortunately, I haven't. Did you go right from school into the service, did you, into the Army? Well, I waited a while. <laughs> waited. There was nothing doing in a line of employment, so I was oh, not yeah. Well, I guess that's steady, all right. The, the, way, <laughs> things, the way things look, it's apt to be steadier than we imagine. <laughs> but I... <laughs> It's better than being around Ethiopia and walking around with umbrellas. I mean, to, to play, like Kylie. What are you going to, uh, you're going to sing, aren't you, Fred? Yes. I, I slipped my mind. I just remembered that Uncle Jim also told me that you tended bar for a while. Is that right? Yes. Sir. I knew that something was on my mind. It's on. <laughs> I guess the fumes of that thought. I, uh, I wanted, <laughs> no, I wanted to ask you. I had an idea some time ago. I want to know if you thought it was practical. I've been reading that beer now is coming out in cans. They're all put up already. Yes. It's going to look funny when the traveling salesmen start turning in their corkscrews in for can openers, isn't it, around the country? <laughs> well, we'll drop the whole thing, and I won't take up any more of your time. What would you like to sing? I'm in the mood for love. I'm in the mood for love. Thank you. <laughs> I'm in the mood for love Simply because you're near me I'm in the mood for love Heaven is in your eyes Just like the stars were under Oh, is it any wonder I'm in the mood for love Why stop to think of weather 
this little dream my pain we put our hearts together now we are one I'm not afraid if there's a cloud above if it should rain we'll let it but for tonight forget it I'm in the mood Again, I was Fred Eukinas from Jackson Heights. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Freeport, Long Island, we welcome the Mural Brothers. Paul and what is the other brother's name? Joseph. Paul and Joseph. And the boys have a 12-piece boys' orchestra uh, from the Freeport High School. Is that right? Yes, Mr. Allen. Are you Paul or Joe? Paul. Oh, you're Paul. I see. I uh, just wanted to make sure. Uh, how many boys in the band, Paul? There are 12. 12 boys in the Freeport band? All go to the same school? Well, not in the band. You mean this band? And this it? band that you're... Oh, this is your own personal band, yes. huh? Oh, that Freeport band's a fly-by-night outfit, I suppose. <laughs> now we're getting someplace. What is the average age of the fellas? Well, about? we average about 15 to 17 years of age. 15 to 17. I know that boy with the cornet looks young enough to be playing on the linoleum over there. <laughs> <I'll>... <laughs> well... Freeport, certainly a great place. A lot of actors used to have their summer homes down there. You see many actors around there now, Paul? No, not many now. Not many now. I guess they're going with the Indians, the way of all... <laughs> I, uh, I used to know a conceited actor who lived down in Freeport. He thought it was his drawing power that brought the tide in down there. I... <laughs> what are you going to play for us, Paul? We're going to play our theme song, Moon Glow, and then, and then some. All right, you go right ahead. The theme song, Moon Glow, your own personal theme song, huh? And then, and then some. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, is that the end of the number, boys? I just wanted to make sure. I saw the guitar player raising it up, and I just wondered what he was up to there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Miss Aline McKenna from Buffalo. Is that right, Miss McKenna? You didn't come down all the way from Buffalo just to be with us tonight, did you? <laughs> well, of course, so many people stray in here that I just like to inquire the motive. How are things in Buffalo? Right. Are they? Niagara Falls still running? <laughs> falling apart. Uh, yes, it is falling apart by degrees. I think the government is just keeping Niagara Falls running so that when they get Boulder Dam finished, they can take the falls over there and see if Boulder Dam really works. I guess that's the purpose of it. <laughs> And you're going to sing, uh, Miss McKenna. 
Only a rose. Only a rose. Thank you very much. Aline McKenna from Buffalo, New York. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please meet the accordion trio. Three girls, Marjorie Kern, Tasra Carolyn, and Annabelle Moser. And three accordions whose names uh, escape me for the moment. The girls have come from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Is that right? Who is Marjorie? Oh, Marjorie, I'm glad, happy to know you. Alan is my name. <laughs> Very glad yeah. to know you. I, uh, you look beautiful in an accordion. You should, you should see me in one of those trombone derbies when I put one of them on. I belong in the case. You were, you girls really live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? I do. Do you really? Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem. Let me see. Bethlehem's notice or something, isn't it? I think for the Bethlehem Steel Corporation. The Bethlehem Steel Corporation. Right, and you girls play accordion. If you were loyal to the neighborhood products, you'd have taken up the steel guitars, girls, and sort of helped out the Bethlehem people in a small way. I, uh, now let me see. Bethlehem is something, famous for something else besides you three girls, too. Now, uh, let's think. The, uh, Lehigh Valley. Is that right? That's right. That's the second most popular valley in the country, isn't it? Rudy first, then the Lehigh. <laughs> I uh, I often wondered. Rudy is uh, so popular with the uh, with the oh, and the Lehigh too. The Lehigh Valley. That's where that expression comes from. He was Lehigh to a grasshopper. <laughs> but I've often worried about. <laughs> Speaking of Rudy, as I was, uh, I often wondered about the effect he has on debutantes. The, the pictures of Rudy. Uh, I don't know. They tell me that when he walks by the YWCA, the entire building trembles. I don't know. <laughs> what are you girls going to play on your three accordions? South American Joe. South American Joe. What was his last name? Do you remember? No, I don't. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. Pennsylvania. 
concludes our amateur contest for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And now, while I exact the truth from our applause meter, Harry will uh, carry on with English as it should be spoken. All right, Harry. Thank you, Fred. We sincerely hope, ladies and gentlemen, that you've enjoyed yourself at Town Hall tonight. And if you have, won't you remember during the week the two products that make these Wednesdays with Fred Allen possible? Ipana toothpaste and salopatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, salopatica for the smile of health. Ipana, salopatica. And I see Fred is still checking the results there of our amateur contest, so let's get the results of Peter Van Steeden's latest arrangement. Okay, Peter. <laughs> Yes, Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, the applause meter divulges that you have awarded the most decibels to the following acts. The accordion trio, Aline McKenna, and the Muro Brothers uh, Boys Orchestra. Now, I'm going to ask Harry to place his stubby hand over the heads of these girls and boys, as I call the names, so that you may applaud once again for your winners for the first and second prizes. Are you ready, Harry? Already, Fred. And now, first, the three girls from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, who played the accordion, uh, played South American Joe, the accordion trio. <laughs> and next from Buffalo, the charming uh, lyric soprano, who sang Only a Rose, Miss Aline McKenna. <laughs> and then the Muro Brothers, 12-piece boys orchestra from Freeport, Long Island. What does the machine say, Harry? Oh, just a minute, Fred. It's coming up. Okay. All right. There are so many in the orchestra, I guess by the time you divide that applause up, it'll run into fractions. <laughs> Things go like that. We have to be very careful with our decibel rating. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The there first are, prize. Fred, right thank you. Fifty dollars in cash and a week's engagement at the Roxy Theater in New York City goes to the Muro Brothers Orchestra <laughs> in Freeport, Long Island. The second prize, $25 in cash, goes to the accordion trio, the three girls from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. To the others, we're happy to have had you here, and better luck next time. Fred Allen saying good night, ladies and gentlemen. And don't forget that the town hall doors will be open wide to greet you next Wednesday evening with another hour of smiles. Join us with Portland, the Mighty Allen Art Players, the Ipana Troubadours, the Town Hall Quartet, and another group of anxious and eager amateurs. This is Fred, spelled Ipana, Allen, spelled Salapatica, saying good night. <laughs> I'm
falling in love with someone performed on this program was from Victor Herbert's Naughty Marietta. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Johnny Green and his orchestra. The orchestra opens the program with Cosi Cosa from the motion picture A Night at the Opera. in New York after almost a year of broadcasting in Hollywood. It's quite a change to be back. Everything seems different, that is, everything except Jell-O, and Jell-O is just as popular in the East as it is in the West. It doesn't make any difference where you go, you'll find everybody likes Jell-O. It's lovely to look at with its vivid, glowing colors, and it's grand to eat with its extra-rich, real fruit flavor. Flavor so rich, so full-bodied, so thoroughly delicious, eating Jell-O is just like eating the real, ripe fruit itself. You won't find this extra rich fruit flavor in any other gelatin dessert, for only Jell-O knows the secret. So don't accept any substitutes for Jell-O. Whether you're ordering Jell-O at your grocers or in hotels or restaurants, always insist on the one and only genuine Jell-O. <laughs> Let us welcome back to New York from California that sun-kissed comedian, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hey, say, Don, Don, is this the room? Yes, Jack, come in. What are you afraid of? Well, I feel kind of funny getting back to such a big studio. Gee, what a crowd of people here. Oh, what's the difference? You're not a stranger. Come on in. Oh, I don't want to. Come on. I'll give you a dish of raspberry jello. Oh, all right, Don. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. <laughs> well, here I am, folks. Jello again. Gee, I feel silly. Well, Jack, uh, how does it seem to be back in New York after being in Hollywood for almost a year? Well, Don, to tell you the truth, I feel kind of strange. I mean, here I am with a coat of tan and two frozen ears. Mm. <laughs> That's surely cold. Uh, where are you stopping in town, Jack? Uh, same place? No, I have a cozy little room on the east side. It's really quite comfortable. Oh, is it far from here? Oh, about a 30-cent sleigh ride. <laughs> Why don't you ski over and see me sometime? Huh? I'll do that. Yeah. New York City, New York City. Gee, you're pretty. It's a pity. You can't be in old Miami where it's warmer. Gee, I'm witty. Hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Say, hey, that's some reception you got. Why not? What good are two hands if you can't flatten them together once in a while? <laughs> well, why don't you thank the studio audience for such a lovely tribute? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Would anybody like to have my autograph? Hmm. See how fickle they are, Jack? I guess you're right, Mary, yeah. You bet I am. Is this the place, Jack? Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome to New York the boy who has never been out of California before, Kenny Baker. Well, Kenny, how do you like being in New York? Gee, I'm thrilled. And uh, how, do you, how do you like the weather? Gee, I'm chilled. <laughs> well, one thing I must tell you, Kenny, you ought to get rid of that straw hat you're wearing. Oh, that's all right. I had it fur lined. Oh. <laughs> what have you been doing since we got in? Have you been around to see the sights? Uh, yes, Jack. I spent all day yesterday in Greenwich Village. Uh, Kenny, that's not Greenwich. You see, here in New York, it's pronounced Greenwich. Greenwich, see? Who did you go with? Johnny Gren. <laughs> hey, did you, uh, did you go anyplace else? Yeah, this morning I went over to see the Statue of Liberty And was I surprised 
Surprise, why? <laughs> I didn't know it was a woman. <laughs> Isn't he cute, Mary? That guy has nothing but youth. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny, you must visit Grant's tomb. I sure I will. Cary Grant's a friend of mine. Listen, Kenny, that's not Cary Grant. That's Ulysses. And that reminds me, Jell-O has six Ulysses flavors. Strawberry, <laughs> raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Mm, delicious Grant, huh? Uh, say, Jack. Yeah? There's Johnny Green. He's been waiting all day for a reception. Oh, well, well. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> Gee, that, that's some reception you got, Jolly. Yeah, wasn't it swell? Hmm, uh -huh. being his hometown didn't hurt him any. <laughs> well, Johnny, how does it feel to be back home again? Oh, great, Jack. I spent two days just visiting relatives. Well, that was nice. Did you see any other sites? Yes, your relatives. <laughs> Listen, my relatives are in Waukegan. Yeah. Where do you get back to your apartment? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the folks did drop in to say hello. Say, Johnny, come here a minute, will you? I want to tell you a funny story I heard on the train. It seems that a woman got... Now, folks, this is Don Wilson welcoming himself back from California. So give Jell-O a big hand. It's really a great dessert and has always been kind to your dish. Come on, folks. <laughs> well, Jell-O appreciates that. Play, John. playing Love as a Dancing Tin from the production at Home Abroad. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in announcing that tonight this program is starting a contest, a real brain test in which all members of your family can participate. Now, there's nothing required in this contest but a little bit of your time and patience. The winner will receive the sum of... Uh, uh, pardon me, Mary, hold this money. Come in. Uh, how do you do? Mr. Benny? Yes. On behalf of my friends and myself, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you back to New York City. Well, thanks. Uh, who are you? Just a Sixth Avenue bum. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I, I, I hope my father wasn't listening. <laughs> well, anyway, folks, as I said before, tonight this program is starting a contest, a real battle of wit and intelligence. And the winner of this contest will receive the tidy sum of... Uh, oh... Hello. Who? Oh, how are you, Mama? Well, well. Yes, I got in Thursday morning. It's Mama Jack. Yeah, give her my love, Mary. Oh, we had a wonderful trip, but the train was four hours late. Gee, if a woman did that, her husband would kill her. <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you, Ma? That's good. Is Father working? He is. Gee, that's great. Who's he working for? Oh, he's in front of the house shoveling snow. Oh, I see. Tell him to try and keep that job, Mary, if you can. 
Uh, what's that? Oh, Jack Fine. Yeah, Hollywood has done him a lot of good. He looks better than George Alice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, how's Otto? He did? Oh, isn't that wonderful? What is it, Mary? Otto went to the Olympic Games in Germany. Yeah, how did he make out? He won the 100-yard dash hunt. <laughs> Quite a long dog. Well, Ma, we'll see you tomorrow. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at, Mary? Mama said goodbye. <laughs> fine program. These greetings are murderous. Well, anyway, folks, tonight we are starting a contest, and the chief requirement will be the brain. Now, as I said before, the winner of this contest will receive the neat sum of, uh, oh, come in. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Wilton, or Jello, I mean Jack Benny. Say, who are you? I'm Jack Benny. What do you want? I'm a reporter in the news, uh, the mirror, the telegraph, that is the, no, the ger I mean the time. Oh, from the Tribune, I see. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to how you been, that is, I mean, how are you, uh, glad to stay, where's Mary Livingston? She's here, we just got back from Hollywood. Hollywood, <laughs> well, well, say, is it true that Wally Beer, I mean, gave, a, what do you know, uh, well, Shirley I, Temple, <laughs> a Shirley Temple, a Gary Cook, I <laughs> or are you going to say, I mean, where's Johnny Green? <laughs> He's here, they are. Now, take it easy, what do you want to know? <laughs> when did you first find out, uh, that, uh, your, or do you think, uh, what's your opinion? I mean, who's well, your favorite? <laughs> well, what's new, Mr. Benny? <laughs> well, I, I would say that conditions in Hollywood are... That's enough. It's a scoop. Now, hold still for a moment. Chin up. Now, smile. I got it. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Hey. Who is that, Jack? Winchell, Sullivan, I mean McIntyre, George, Gene, Na I don't know, Sing, Crosby, Valley, or Baker. Okay. Mary, find me a cheap sanitarium, will you? I'm a roving cowboy far away from home. Far from the prairie, where you roam, where the doggies wander and the wind blows free. Oh, my heart is yonder on the lone prairie. Oh, carry me back to the lone prairie, where the coyotes howl and the wind blows free. And when I die, you can bury me Need the western sky on the lone prairie oh, Back my gun Give me back that bronco that I used to run Let me spread my blanket The cowboy singing by the firelight's gleam. Oh, carry me back to the lone prairie where the coyotes howl and the wind blows free. And when I die, you can bury me Need the western sky on the lone prairie My oh Very good, Kenny. We're nervous or anything. Yes, sir. That was uh, Kenny Baker singing Carry Me Back to the Lone Prairie. And now tonight, folks, as I said before, we are starting a contest in which skill will play an important part. All you have to do is follow the rules closely, and the winner will receive a cash prize amounting to... <laughs> the mailman. <laughs> 
Let's see what it is, Mary. Come in, you little joy spreader. <laughs> it's a letter for you, Jack. Give it to me. Hmm. It's from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, the Canadian Northwest. It says, Dear Jacques Benet. <laughs> we have been listening to your... I hope they talk like that. Didn't you? We have been listening to your programs every Sunday and have heard enough about Hollywood and its climate. We people up here in the frozen north eat jello too. Why don't you do a play about our part of the country? Our home is near the Yukon. So give us a play of the Northwest or you know what Yukon do. <laughs> hmm, she thinks she's funny. Signed, uh, Victoria Vancouver. Must be wealthy people. Uh, do you know anybody up that way, Mary? Uh, just Winnie Peg. Oh, okay. He had much, Jack, and I've even named a town after you. It's called Moose Jaw. <laughs> Please do not ignore this letter. I wish people would give us a little more notice. Say, Mary, we got a play of the Northwest. Uh, how about Tobacco Road? No, Mary, the Northwest, ice, snow, zero. Where can we get a play like that? I can write one, Jack. You can? Well, hurry up. Maybe we can do it. Then. Make it snappy, Mary, will you? There you are, Jack. <laughs> I thought I'd never get it. <laughs> Let's see it. Uh, see, Sergeant Benny of the Northwest Mounted Police. Fur trappers report fur stolen. They notify you the Mounties. Well, that sounds all right. Of course, the second and third act will need a little fixing. Well, anyway, folks, this play will go on immediately after Johnny Green's next number. Say, Johnny, can you play the part of a French-Canadian? I can play the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> How about you, Wilson? Uh, Parlez-vous Francais? No, I just play one horse at a time. <laughs> oh, do I step into those things, huh? Parlez, John. Unmounted musicians playing Mile a Minute with Johnny at the piano. And now for our play, Sergeant Benny of the Northwest Mounted. The scene takes place in Alaska between Fairbanks and Pickford. <laughs> Do you know him? <laughs> Am I cold tonight, huh? Mary, you wrote this, didn't you? Yes. Well, the Northwest Mounted are in Canada. I made it Alaska. It's colder up there. Oh, I see. Well, then remember, boys, we're all French Alaskans. Uh, you're really Texas Rangers that got lost. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, then. Sergeant Benny of the Northwest Mounted. Curtain. Music. <laughs> When the moon comes over the mounted of the Northwestern Mounted Police. Help 
Hello, Northwest Mounted speaking. You've been robbed. Well, get your own man. It's too cold tonight. <laughs> Gee, it's cold up here in Alaska. Shoot. Yep. She's a cold night. Here he comes, more snow. <laughs> uh, where, um... <laughs> where is Officer Andre? Andre is in his igloo. Igloo? What is an igloo? A lot of ice without ginger ale. <laughs> oh. Well, tell Andre I want for to see him. Andre? The sergeant, she want for to see you. Abba dabba glow pow. What's that? I'm an Eskimo. <laughs> Here I am, Sarge. Andre, look at the thermometer. What does she say? It is 40 jello zero. 40, eh? What is AT&T? 171. Buy me, buy me 10 shares of thermometer. And keep the window closed so it'll go up. Now, Mary, where does our play go from here? Uh, wait a minute, Jack. Just a minute, I'll have it. Here you are. Oh, yeah. The first line is mine. Andre, where are the rest of the mounted police? Where is Jean and Pierre? They're having trouble with their horses. Mary, in Alaska, they have dogs. They have them in New York, too, but I want horses. Oh. <laughs> Send for them, Andre. Sergeant, you sent for us, and we are here. What do I say? Uh, here's your part, Kenny. Oh, hello, Sarge. <laughs> I hear you are having trouble with the horses. Oui, oui. We play them to win, and they come in second. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would get a bigger laugh. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> now, listen, you are all brave men, but you hang around and do nothing. What do you want that we shall do, Sarge? The book, he show we have been here 12 years. There have been 435 robbery and 12 murder. And not once did you get your man. What do you say to D? Maybe we're not the type. <laughs> There is something to that. Come in. Electric fans, ice cream cones? No, not today. <laughs> what was that, Mary? I just put that in as a menace. Oh. Go ahead, Jack. Now, I warn you, men, these cannot go on any longer. You must either get your man or get out. Who is that? That's Benny Rubin. I wrote a part for him, too. Oh, is Rubin in this? Yes. Oh, uh -huh. come in. I beg your pardon, but is this the Northwestern Mountain Place I'm speaking to? Sure and it is. I mean we. <laughs> what is the trouble? Well, it's in the first trap in business I'm in. And I'm just trying to make an honest living skinning skunks and minding me own business. <laughs> and Mr. Sergeant, what do you think happened? Tell him to me. Well, this morning when I woke up, some thief skinned me out of me skunk skin. <laughs> And if I'm lying to you, I hope to be bitten by a snake and have to take three drinks of good liquor. You say you were skunked out of your skin? No, sir. Skinned out of me skunk. What, uh, what is he supposed to be, Mary? A Greek. Oh. <laughs> well, go back and take it again, will you, Reuben? A Greek this time, right, will you? Greek. Come in. Uh, pardon me. Is this the Northwest Mounted Police I'm speaking on? <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that, is that what you wanted, Mary? I don't know. I think so. Oh. Well, what is the trouble? About one year ago, I come here from Greases, and I want to go into hunting business, so I get myself a hunting dog to catch the skunk. And the first thing he does is catch my brother. <laughs> well, sir, I want to tell you that at that time, I was making very big money. <laughs> but one fine day, I found me a dialect changing on me. Your dialect changing? Yes, sir. Would you believe it? <laughs> the lunchroom, and believe it, Ripley or not, I went into the fur business, and here I am, a belt picker, dealing in the skins you love to catch. Hey, wait, did you ever meet Schlepperman? Schlepperman, of course, he's my Hollywood representative. <laughs> well, anyway, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Thank you. Mine first was stolen this morning, and a skin cannot walk away without the animal inside. We have just heard what this man said. There is a fur thief in the Northwest. Now do your duty. Keep up the good name of the Northwest Mounted. Go and get your man. But, Sergeant, where can we find this man? I have a clue. Pierre, you go to Manitoba. John, you go to Manhattan. 
And Andre, you go to, uh... To Montreal. Right. Get going. Thank you, Sergeant, and say by the by. In the meantime, if your wife wants a nice piece of 20th century fart, here's my card. <laughs> Slap them in and snore it. Skinners and furriers. Where are you to? <laughs> well, well, Mary, where does our play go from here? Oh, don't worry. I'll have it. While Mary is writing the next scene, let me tell you about Jell-O. It has that new extra-rich, fresh fruit flavor and tastes twice as good as ever before. So be sure to look for the big red letters on the package. Is it ready yet, Mary? No. Then let me tell you about our contest. Tonight we are starting an unusual contest in which every member of your family can participate. The first prize, without any strings whatsoever attached to it, will be the sum of... Here it is, Jack. <laughs> I wonder what the boys are doing now. So do I. That's your line, Jack. Oh, oh, I see. I wonder what the boys are doing now. Come in. Here you are, Sergeant. You told us to get our man and we got him. Here's the fellow who stole his fell. That is not him. Hey, wait, so what's the matter with you? You got the wrong people. I'm the man who lost this fur. <laughs> Mary, for heaven's sake, you wrote this. What do we do now? I don't know. What do you think, Jack? I don't know. What do you think, Reuben? Well, in a situation such as that... I've got it. Why don't you kiss and make up like they do in pictures? That's it, but who are we going to kiss? Not me. Play, Johnny Grimm. <laughs> Some folks like jazz music, some like ballads, some prefer grand opera. But here's one symphony everybody will go for, a fruit symphony made with jello. Try it on your family and you'll hear some compliments that will be music to your ears. To make fruit symphony, here's what you do. Dissolve a package of lemon jello in warm water and to chill. When it's thickened a bit, put in two cups of diced grapefruit, a half cup each of cut up orange and pineapple. When you turn it out of the mold, you have a sunburst of color, clear, glowing lemon jello with grapefruit, orange, and pineapple shining through. It's a swell wintertime fruit dessert, and it tastes just as intriguing as it looks. Be sure, though, to make your fruit symphony with genuine Jell-O, for only Jell-O tastes extra rich, twice as good. of the uh, 20th program of the new Jell-O series. And we'll be with you again uh, next... Pardon me, Jack. Uh, here's a telegram that just came for you. Do you mind if I read it? No, no, Don. Go right ahead. It says, Dear Jack, the Jell-O family of all six flavors extends to you their heartiest congratulations on the splendid showing you made in the National Radio Editor's Poll conducted annually by the New York World Telegram. Stop. For the second consecutive year, our Jell-O program was voted the favorite of all the shows on the air. And for the third consecutive year, you were selected America's outstanding radio comedian. Jell-O shares your justified pride in this fine accomplishment. Signed, Clarence Francis, President General Foods, makers of Jell-O. Well, thanks, Don. I'm very, very happy about it. Thank you. And, uh, I, uh, I want to thank my author, Harry W. Kahn all the members of my cast and everybody associated with the Jell-O program, and, of course, the radio editors for their kind consideration. And I'd like to say that, uh, well, that uh, Frank Parker is sitting in our audience tonight, who was a great figure in helping us win the poll last year. <laughs> I wish we had time to have him come up and say hello, but we haven't. Huh? You forgot to mention me, Jack. I did say members of my cast. Mm, fine name, Mary Cast. Well, good night, folks. What became of my contest? The collection Love and Bloom is from She Loves Me Not. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presenting the Zigbell Follies of the Air, starring Fanny Price and James Melton. (laughs) 
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the Zigzell Follies, presented tonight as every Saturday night by Colgate Palm Olive Pete, to introduce you to Palm Olive, the world's largest selling beauty soap. The soap made with olive oil to keep skin young and lovely. <laughs> Opening night at the Polish tonight, and every one of you through the magic of radio has a seat. A seat to the greatest show on Broadway created 29 years ago by that master showman of America, Florence Ziegfeld. The Ziegfeld Follies, cradle of the world's greatest entertainers. From this stage, the master showman Ziegfeld presented unknown. Overnight, they became stars. Eddie Catter, the lovely Nora Bays, W.C. Field, Golden Voice, Ruth Etting, Gladys Glad, Marilyn Miller of the Twinkling Feet, Fanny Bryce, the lovely dancer, Ann Pennington. The famous blackface comedian and singer Bert Williams, Leon Errol, James Barton, and most loved of all, the late Will Rogers first gave out his home, the American philosophy, over the lights of the Ziegfeld stage. Do you wonder there's excitement in the air? It's another opening night, another opening of the greatest, the most extravagant, the most beautiful show on Broadway. Excitement out front, people clamoring for tickets, everyone heading for the follies, excitement backstage, outside Fanny Bryce's dressing room. Tell Miss Bryce it's me, James Melvin. Oh, come in, Jimmy. Sit down a minute, Jimmy. Say, I'm all excited. So am I. And scared. I always get shivers up and down my spine before an opening night. And tonight it's more than just in an opening night. Think of it, Jimmy. We're bringing the Six Cells Follies to every corner of the United States. It's just got to be good. You bet it has. Ten million people will be listening in. People in California, Omaha, Nebraska. Every person in the United States can hear our Six Cells Follies tonight. Say, uh, what are all those telegrams on the table? Wires, wires from all over the United States, Jimmy. Look, here's one from Billy Bird. Mm -hmm. We'll be listening into the Follies here in my Hollywood home, just as if I were there. Stop. Tom Olive is to be congratulated. Good luck. Here's one from W.C. Fields. Thrilled to hear Flo Zigfeld's Follies is being broadcast. I'll be with you by radio. And look at this one from Alan Miller. I'll be with you as of old, though I'm thousands of miles away. Good luck. Here's one from Ruth Etting. And another from Leon And Miller. one from Gladys Glad. <laughs> Telegrams, telegrams, telegrams from Eddie Cantor, from Ruth Etting, from W.C. Field. Telegrams from every corner of the nation, from stars who will hear the Ziegfeld Follies of the Air in their own homes. Yes, and you too, in the comfort of your own easy chairs, can enjoy every scene. Laugh at the comedy of our feminine star, Fanny Bryce. Thrill to the great songs of James Melton, our singing star. To the lovely voice of Patty Chapin, Broadway's newest sensation. To the music of Al Goodman's orchestra. To the dancing and singing of our famous Ziegfeld Chorus. Yes, thrill to the Follies tonight, opening night, and the story behind the Follies. The story of Alice Moore, who wants to see her name in electric light. The story of a girl who wants to become a star in the Follies. Let's follow her now as she walks down the alley to the entrance that leads back to Alice. Oh, Eddie, what are you doing here? I just had to see you for a minute or two, so I came here. We haven't had much time together this last week or two. Oh, I know, Eddie, I've been so busy getting ready for the Follies opening night that I really... That's just what I wanted to come here to see you about, Alice. We're going to be married in two weeks, and I've come to ask you to give up this usher's job tonight. Oh, but, Eddie, I've told you it isn't just the usher's job. It's, it's a means to an end. What end? Well, Eddie, you see those great big letters in electric light with Fanny Bryce's name? Mm-hmm. Well, someday you're going to see my name up there. Mm. Alice Moore. Oh, no, Alice. That really isn't what you want. You want a home. Oh, of course. Now, but listen, dear. We're going to settle down and raise a family. Oh, Eddie, I want those things, too. But, but first, I've got to make a stab at this. Oh, I've got something inside of me that won't let me rest. I want to be somebody, Eddie. Oh, so be when I walk down the street and I see electric lights with big names on them, something inside talks to me and says, Alice, that's going to be you someday. Mm. Someday, somehow, some way, I'm going to be famous, Eddie. I know it. Why, well, I can see. Yes, but oh, maybe you don't me. think so, but I know it. And I'm going to make the whole world know it. Oh, I'll make you so proud to have me as your wife. You've made up your mind? Mm-hmm. And you won't quit this, this usher job tonight? No, Eddie, I won't. Alice, it isn't as if I didn't have enough money. I can support you. Oh, it and... isn't you, Eddie. It's me. It's, it's something inside that's bigger than me. Bigger than you two, Eddie. Bigger than both of us. Oh, what? Oh, there's no bigger. reason why we can't both work. After I get to the top, we'll have our family, Eddie. But, but first, I want to... You're wanna... sure this is the thing you want? I'm sure, Eddie. More than you want me. What? 
Well, what do you mean? I mean, unless you quit your job tonight and give up this foolish stage idea, the wedding is off. We're through. You... You mean if I... If I don't quit tonight, you don't want to marry me? That's right. It's one thing or the other. No wife of mine will work along Broadway in this theater atmosphere. But, but Edie, you don't understand why it's only to be... Oh, that's fine, because... Ellen. I want your, uh, your answer now, Alice. Now. Now? Yes, now. Well, Eddie, maybe... Maybe I'm a fool, but I'm hitching my wagon to a star. I've got to go through with this, no matter what the consequences. That's final? Oh, Eddie, I... Is that final? Yes. Then goodbye, Alice. Eddie. Eddie, I'm sorry. Please understand. Goodbye. Goodbye. So Alice Moore chooses between marriage and a dream. Now she enters the theater to take her place at the head of aisle two. Spick and span in her baited Polly's theater uniform. What will the Polly's opening mean to her? The feeling of suspense, of tension is in the air. It affects everyone in the theater. Actors, stars, writers, musicians, stagehands, ushers. Yes, and of course it affects Alice Moore. In this theater lie her dreams. Dreams of success, of glamour, dreams of stardom. We follow her as she takes her place at the head of aisle two in the Polly Theater. Let me have some of those programs. Mine are all gone. Hey, what do you do, Alice? Eat them? No, my section's about all full already. See, they could fill the theater five times tonight, huh? Can I see your tickets, please? First stairway to the left. See, some people are dumb. They got balcony written on the ticket. What's the matter, Alice? You're awful pale. Don't you feel well? Uh, I just broke up with Eddie. What? After going with a boy for two years? Say, hey, you crazy. Maybe. Listen, Alice, all I can say is think twice before you walk out on a good guy. Hey, Irene, would you do something for me? Maybe. What is it? Give this note to Fanny Bryce. A note? Why don't you give it to her yourself? Oh, I haven't, I haven't the nerve. What? I wanted to hear you sing. I wrote it about a week ago and... Oh, oh just give it to her, will you, please? Oh, stage struck. <laughs> sure, I'll give it to her. Do it now. Maybe she'll see me after the first act. Yeah, Maybe. The lights are dimming. You could go backstage now. Swell chance. You know Fanny Bryce is as nervous as a cat before the curtain goes up. I told you I'd get it before you are. the first act's over. Well, where are you going? Backstage. Well, give her that letter, will you? That's what I'm doing. A letter to Fanny Bryce. A letter and a prayer. It is the moment of moments. Out front of the boxes, Lady and Ermans, gentlemen in tails, in the orchestra seats, in the balconies, in the ball headed row, people eagerly awaiting the opening of the new 1936 Follies. Out of the door in the orchestra pit comes a keen-looking man in white tie and tails. He steps onto the conductor's stand. It's Al Goodman. He takes the bow. He's opening his 110th show. He smiles to his wife in the seat behind him. Up goes the baton, and the overture begins. The 1936 Follies has begun. Ditty 
arithmetic is bad. I'm going to give you a lesson. Now listen very carefully. If I lay one egg over here, and if I lay two eggs over here... Oh, Professor, I don't believe you can do it. <laughs>
Why didn't you come when I called you? I didn't hear you the first two times. <laughs> Snooks, look at the mess in this parlor. For well, the vase is broken, ink on the carpet, the window is smashed. Did you do this? No. Don't look down at your feet, Snooks. Look in my face when you answer me. Who made this mess? Nurse has done it, Daddy. Why, Snooks, you know Nursey is off today. Yeah, but she came back and done it. I see her, Daddy. You did, eh? Well, why is your dress covered with the same ink? She spilled ink on me, too, Daddy. Snooks, you know that Nursie went out of town this morning to visit her sick sister. She couldn't possibly have come back. I forgot. She done it yesterday. Yesterday, this room was in perfect shape. Now, Snooks, tell me the truth. How did this happen? Why did you break that vase? I had to do it, Daddy. You had to? Why? On account of the three rattlesnakes. What three rattlesnakes? What did you say, Daddy? You said you had to break the vase on the count of three rattlesnakes. Yeah, Daddy. They came into the parlor and I killed them. Snooks, you know you're not telling the truth. Well, uh, maybe it was only two rattlesnakes and a cake of palm olive soap. <laughs> now, how do you expect me to believe a story like that? There couldn't possibly be any rattlesnakes in the parlor. Yes, there was, Daddy. There was one in here and I killed him. There isn't a rattlesnake in this whole part of the country. Well, it was an awful big worm. <laughs> a worm in the parlor. Show me the worm. I can't. Why not? The eagle ate it up. <laughs> what eagle? The eagle that knocked over the bottle of ink. Now listen, Snooks, I've had enough of this. I want you to tell me the truth. If you tell me the truth, I won't punish you. Now promise me you won't fib anymore. All right, Daddy. Now what happened? Well... I took off the ink bottle to write a letter. Yes. And a big lion jumped in through the window and scared me. A lion jumped through the window? Yeah, that's how the window got through. I see. Well, if a lion jumped through the window, why didn't the pieces of glass fall on the outside? Well, the lion jumped in backwards. <laughs> Go on. So I ran into the other corner and there was... Poor lion, and they all jumped on me, Daddy. And then what happened? I got killed. <laughs> How could you tell me such stories about lions? You know you never even saw a lion. I did so, Daddy. Where did you see a lion? Mrs. Smith has one next door, and that's the lion that came in. Mrs. Smith has a lion? You know very well that's nothing but a little yellow dog. Now I want you to kneel down and pray for forgiveness for telling so many fibs. All right. That's it. Now you pray to the Lord to make you an honest child. All right. I pray to the Lord. That's a good girl. I'm finished, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Did you pray? Yes, Daddy. And the Lord said, I forgive you, Miss Snook. The first time I looked at that yellow dog, I thought he was a liar, too. <laughs> I don't care 
Mrs. Detail says that beauty is the modern woman's duty, and that brings us to you. So, if you think that he was right, lend an ear to us tonight. Here's a man, we cannot doubt it, who can tell us all about it. Jean Paul King. <laughs> Well, at any rate, I can tell the ladies and gentlemen in the audience something about you glorified American girls that they see on the stage. But, Mr. King, be discreet. After all, we have to eat. Oh, I'll be discreet, I promise. They are beautiful, aren't they, ladies and gentlemen? Gloriously beautiful. You bet they are. And if it's the modern girl's duty to be beautiful, I think they perform their duty well. Which brings me to the real reason why I'm appearing on the Folly stage tonight. These girls use the beauty soap I'm going to talk to you about, palm olive soap, and I'm sure it has helped in their glorification. That's right, isn't it, girls? Thank you, Mr. King. What's the uh, average age of you glorified girls? You promised, Jerry, to be discreet. Our years and days, we won't repeat. <laughs> That's right, I did promise discretion. But the fact of the matter is, friends, that while these girls are young, some of them are not quite so young as they look. They all do look young, very young. Not one of them looks to be out of her late teens. Why? Because of the care they give their skin. As I said, they use palm olive soap, the famous beauty soap made with olive and palm oil. Now, if you will use palm olive soap as they do, you will keep the skin young, fresh-looking, lovely, or recapture its old youthfulness and beauty. Let me tell you why. Nature gives the skin certain oils, youth oils, whose work it is to keep the skin soft, smooth, young. Without them, the skin becomes dry, rough, and old-looking. Made with olive oil, palm olive soap protects these youth oils of the skin. And that's how the smooth, gentle lather of palm olive can take years from the appearance of your skin. Palm olive soap has helped to glorify these girls here, and millions of others all over the world. And palm olive soap can help you to have a lovelier, fresher, more gloriously youthful skin. Then... Don't you think it would be well worth your while to try palm olive, to begin using it regularly and exclusively tomorrow, and quickly bring added glamour and youth to your skin? That's the kind of good advice that leads to wedding bells and lights, and that brings us to you. So, to keep you all happy, we always can try we think you'll find laughter in scene number five. It's a song, yes. a dance, yes. and a story of romance. Mm. You'll be delighted. And a tenor. And it's yes. The bride comes home to title, meaning that is what it's called. Al Goodman. Where's Elmer? 
Oh, here I'll be. Out for a good time if it costs me 50 cents. Where's Eleanor? Oh, God, darn if it ain't a gal looking for me. Oh, oh, there you are, Mr. Hicks. Mr. Hicks, are you a married man? <laughs> no, but my pa was. <laughs> oh, you sweet man. I'm going to kiss you. Huh? <laughs> Where's Elmer? <laughs> Miss Jones, take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband. I do. And do you, Mr. Hicks, take this young woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Where's Elmer? <laughs> Our son Elmer married off to a nice gal home on the farm. Yes, sir. The wedding ceremony today was right lovely. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma. Them kids sure must have been tired after the wedding. They're tired as soon as they get home. <laughs> Probably fast asleep by now. Yes, sir. Well, if it ain't my new daughter-in-law, thought you'd be fast asleep by now. What bail him? Where's Elmer? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
audience is wearing its hands out with applause. Al Goodman turns and his wife reaches out from her first row seat and clasps his hand. Backstage, everyone is gathered around Fanny Bryce. Everyone. James Melton in white tie and tails. Patty Chapin in silver sequins. The glorified chorus girls in their midnight costumes from the finale. Stage hands and shirt sleeves and suspenders. They're all talking. Congratulations, Fanny. I thought you were swell. Oh, how about yourself, Jimmy? All good to you. Thank you, Fanny. I hope so. Say, who is that little girl walking towards Miss Bryce's room? Huh? Oh, I don't know her name. What are the ushers out for? Good looking, kid. Oh, oh, pardon me. Say, don't you think we have enough to do to strike this set without you coming around here? Well, I'm just going to Miss Bryce's room. Why don't you stay in your own side of the tent? Joe. Yeah? Joe, where's Miss Bryce's room? She don't want like business between acts. Oh, she's expecting me. Oh, yeah? Oh, where is it, Joe? Right in front of, in front of you. Don't you see the big star I sit on the door? Oh, oh, thanks. Look out. Do you want to kill yourself? Oh. Not first. Don't walk in. She's changing her costume. All right. It's me. Yes? I, I want to see Miss Bryce. She can't see nobody now. If you got a message from the front, I'll take it. Who is it, Jenny? One of the actors from the front. Alice Moore, tell her. Alice Moore, Miss Bryce. Oh, tell her I'm sorry. I can't see anybody now. Uh, tell her I'll see her for a few minutes after the show. Miss Bryce says she'll see you after the show. Oh, thanks. Did she get my letter? Yes, I think she did. Thanks. I'll be back right after the next act. In just a few moments, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in the Follies Theater for the second act. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Presenting the Zigzell Follies with Fanny Bryce, James Melton, Patty Chief, and Al Goodman's orchestra and the Zigzell Chorus, glorifying the American girl. This production is presented to you by Palm Olive Soap. Use it for your complexion, for your bath, for shampooing your hair. As you see a fresh glow in your skin, as you notice a new and youthful glamour in your complexion, you will realize why it is that palm olive is the preferred toilet soap the world over. And now, on with the show. And the ushers all have said, there's nothing like a uniform to turn a lady's head. And that brings us in view. So, the boys will march as stiff as starch to start our second act. And as they sing, your ears will ring with joy you may have lacked. The changing of the guard is what we've understood. It's scene number seven, and it's uniformly good. Forward march! <laughs> The changing of the guard, stand, lady, within the palace yard. And if you see to enter, fail to press, to know to choose the veil, to watch from there. The changing of the guard, the palace of there, you see. The changing of the guard, and stand, lady, within the palace yard. I touch your fine and on every hand, to chop the top of where the command behold, behold, the changing of the guard. Have you been to London? Never been to London. When you come to London, I tell the public of truth. Walk down the street, take in the treat. And there's the usual thing. And if you're south of keen on houses, why not join the king? Go down the road to come to the palace. Satisfaction. 
something that is nothing like love, and that brings us to you. So, Patty Chapin has decided you should know love's so-called bliss, and we can hardly wait for scene number eight. It's dangerous to love like this. Patty Chapin. <laughs> Schultz, I furnished you with a husband last week. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. <laughs> well, say, I remember when you and Mr. Schultz got caught in a revolving door. Was that the first time you met? No, but that's when we started going around together. Well, Mrs. Schultz, I've got just the man for you. A wealthy widower. A wealthy widower? Yes, and he'll treat you right. He'll give you parties. And before you're married, he'll give you a shower. A shower? Yes, and I'll come to that shower. Tell me, what shall I bring? You bring the palm olive soap. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Bright's in a different pose, as back in the bureau she goes. All righty. Ah, oh, this chap of the morning to you, Mr. Burns. I'm a poor witty woman, and it's looking for a husband I am. Well, I'll try to accommodate you, Mrs. O'Reilly. Tell me, did you get along with your last husband? Sure, we lived like a couple of love birds. Of course, once in a while, O'Reilly would get drunk and bake me up. And occasionally, I'd lose me temper and crown him with a rolling pin. 
But never once did he have to call in the police. Did he ever strike your children? No, only in self-defense. <laughs> they was good to me and the children, poor mm-hmm. Mike. Tell me, did he did he ever come home and throw his arms around you? Sometimes before I could even strike a blow. <laughs> well, I've got a fine man here for you, but he wants a wife who's a good cook. What's your favorite dish? With Mike, it was the heaviest one I could lay my hands on. <laughs> Who was your husband before O'Reilly? He was a man by the name of Quinn. Well, that's a good old Irish name, Quinn. <laughs> Did he spell it Q-U-I-N-N? No, he wasn't Irish. His name was Quinn. C-O-H-E-N, Quinn. <laughs> here in front of the curtain to accept applause. No, indeed, not that I don't like it. I love it. But I really came out to tell you a little something about scene number 10. You know, I've been in the folly through 18 years. I've watched youngsters come in unknown and almost overnight become stars. Seen them come and I've seen them go. And what memories? Memories of great performers. My friends Eddie Cantor, W.C. Fields, Marilyn Miller, Ruth Eddie, and Gilda Gray. Oh, I could name them on and on for hours. And tonight, as we launched this new Zigzag Follies of 1936, we worked out a Follies review to bring back some of those memories. Memories of other performances when slow Zigzag glorified the American girl. The producers have asked me to introduce this review to you. So, Al Goodman, if you're ready, bring up the curtain. <laughs> Harvest moon shining bright, sat Miss Nora Baines and her lover one night. Back in 1908, was a wonderful sight. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon, up in the sky. I ain't had no longing since April, January, June, or July. No time, there's no time to stay out for them to Oh, shine on, shine on, harvest moon For me and my guests Remember our friend with the googly eyes? The last year of the war, he gave us a surprise when Cantor sang this, the applause you'll surmise. Believe me, eyes, and every time she sighs, you forget your family. The other evening in a cabaret we spent. When I saw the check, I thought it was the rent. But when the waiter came, she simply signed her name. That's the kind of a baby for me. When John Steele sang this song, the girls all would be. The Simpsons selected as slow Zigbell scene. After 17 years, the song still is to free. Run around your brain, you can't 
my men were sore. They applauded them back, calling more, more, and more. Gallagher. Oh, Mr. Gallagher. Hello, what's on your mind this morning, Mr. Sheen? Cost of living went so high that it's cheaper now to die. Positively, Mr. Gallagher. Absolutely, Mr. Sheen. Oh, wonderful day. I'll never forget... Sunny Marilyn Miller. And she was so good. Flo just adds a villa in a girl's minstrel show that was surely a thriller. scatter too. They're in their dressing room taking off makeup, carefully hanging up colorful costumes. They're talking. Oh, I can hardly wait. Gee, I'm so excited. Oh, I've got to buy my mother right now. Oh, now I can buy that darling evening 
Giraffe I saw in Sachs the other day. Oh, here comes Henry to see. Who's he? Well, don't you know? He's the greatest makeup expert in the world. Oh, yeah. Well, hello, girls. Say, I wanted to tell you, that makeup looked great tonight. It did? It certainly did. Oh, well, it comes off nicely, too, Mr. Despain. Well, that's good news. Because I recommended a supply of palm olive soap for you girls to use when removing it. Did you recommend palm olive soap for our showers, too, Mrs. Stain? Yes, I did. Good for you. The best soap for bathing I've ever used, and it's not one of those strong, smelling soaps, either. Right. You know, it's a funny thing, but many people seem to think they've got to use a strong, smelling soap for the bath. They're afraid that otherwise they won't be, well, won't really feel clean. You know, if I were one of you girls out there in the front line, I wouldn't use anything but palm olive, either for your faces or your bathing. You want to keep young looking. And you don't want some hard-boiled stage manager to say to you someday, Say, babe, you're getting too old for the folly. <laughs> when you're only 26 years old, palm olive helps to keep your skin young. Well, girls, good night. Good night. Congratulations and have a swell time at your party. Thank you. Good night. They're off to the party. They're off to gaiety. But Alice Moore, what of Alice Moore, the little usher? She's going backstage to talk with Fanny Bryce. And for Alice Moore, that's the greatest event in her young life. We'll follow her backstage. Jenny. Oh, Jenny. come right in. Thank you. Jenny, come on, look this thing for me. I'm coming. Sit down, Mr. Moore. Alice Moore. Oh, yes. Get the shoulder strap straight, Jenny. Yes, sir. I read your note, Alice. Did it, Miss Bryce? It was awfully nice of you to read it. If you notice the date on it, I wrote it about ten days ago. What, did you? Uh, my brother did it. Yes, I am. Well, well, if you're too busy, I can come back some other time. Oh, it's all right. Do you think you can sing? Is that what's bothering you? Yes, Miss Bryce. I can do every one of your songs. Every single one of them. <laughs> Not as good as you do them, of course, but... Oh, don't do imitations. Do something of your own. Be yourself. Nobody gets very far copying. That's what imitations are. My other slipper, Jenny. Yes, sir. Well, I can do things of my own, too, Miss Bryce. You can? Uh-huh. That was a long letter you wrote me, Alice. That's just how I feel, Miss Bryce. Maybe they're just cold words written in ink to you, but every word I wrote came right from inside of me. Oh, you must have felt once what I'm feeling now. I guess I did. But I wish I'd had somebody to tell me what I'm going to tell you. Yes. If you had the talent of ten Fanny Bryce's, I'd say, stay away from it. Oh. And someday when you've married a nice boy and you have a lovely family, you'll come back and thank me. Oh, I won't. I, I know I won't. You love what you're doing. You couldn't do it if you didn't, Miss Bryce. I'm only asking you to help me. Some people to see you, Miss Bryce. In a minute. My dress in. Yes. Will you? Well, won't you just let me sing for you sometime? Don't tell me those are real tears. Well, I only wanted you to hear me. And if I tell you that, that you haven't anything, will you give it up? No. No? No, I won't. Well, you've got something. I don't know what it is, but it's something. Miss Bryce, some people to see you. Tell them to come in. And I guess that's my exit cue. Right now it is. But I've got an entrance line for you, too, Alice. Oh, Miss Bryce, that's grand. Here's a pencil. Take it down. Butterfield 78492. Mm -hmm. Call me up uh, tomorrow morning at 11. Now I want to hear you. Butterfield 78492. Got it? Oh, yes. Don't lose it. Don't worry, Miss Bryce. I won't. <laughs> Alice Moore holding tight to a slip of paper with Fanny Bryce's telephone number written on it. And a promise of an audition leaves the Folly Theater happiest song in her heart. She has looks, ambition, she has courage. What is her destiny? Is it linked up with the Follies we heard tonight? Is it linked up with Fanny Bryce, James Melton, and Patty Chapin? We'll see. We'll see. We'll be here next week for the second edition of the Ziegfeld Follies of the Air with the greatest, the most popular hits of Broadway today and yesterday. The Ziegfeld Follies of the Air. Don't miss it. Don't miss the story behind the scenes, the story of pretty Alice Moore. Music, drama, comedy, and thrills next week in the Ziegfeld Follies. It's a date with your radio. And if you live in New York or are coming to New York, don't miss seeing the Ziegfeld Follies in person at the Winter Garden Theater. As you listen to the Follies tonight, friends, we hope that you paid careful attention to what we've had to say about palm olive soap. We hope, too, that no later than Monday you will act upon these suggestions. 
will get just three cakes of palm olive from your dealer. See for yourself the wonders it can work in bringing new smoothness, new beauty to your skin. And now, until next Saturday night, palm olive bids you good night. Columbia Broadcasting System. Remington Rand presents Five Star Final. Five Star Final is on the air to bring you the news of the world we live in. To show you love, light, hate, heroism. To make vividly real to you the stirring events that make us all actors in the drama of life. <laughs> Buffalo, New York. From the offices of the world's leading manufacturers of office equipment and typewriters comes glad news for... A university student like myself who needs a rapid, accurate, smooth-running typewriter. A businessman as I am, who does a lot of work at home and must have neatly typed letters and papers. A stenographer like myself. We need an economical new typewriter for correspondence and profitable extra work which I can do at home. Details of the glad news from Remington Rand will be given at the end of this program. Be ready with pencil and paper to write down the information that will help put extra dollars in your purse or pocketbook. <laughs> Camden, New Jersey. Two years ago, the elderly Mr. Gouldy E. Faust was talking with a noted architect. Sit down, sir. And listen carefully to what I have to say. Very well, Mr. Fox. Have you ever designed a mausoleum? That's a little out of my line. I imagine so. But still, do you think you could do this for me? Yes. In fact, I'd be rather anxious to do one. In Europe, I saw and studied the famous tomb of the Medicis built by Michelangelo. I'd like to design one myself. It may be expensive, though. Don't worry about the expense. I'll take care of that. Have you any particular design in mind? I want a structure... That will reflect the peace and nobility of death. A structure that will have the dignity and awe inspired by death. But above all, it must be a thing of beauty. For in death, I want to be amidst the peace and beauty I could not find in life. Could you handle the assignment, sir? I can try. You'll have my first designs within a week. <laughs> Within a few months, masons and sculptors were at work on the tomb of Gouldy E. Faust. Each day, the aging white-haired man came to watch the construction of his last resting place. Last year, the tomb stood finished, a model of quiet, sober beauty. In all, it cost the aging man $10,000. Then Mr. Faust decided, There is nothing to do now but wait. Night, the figures of two men are silhouetted against the moon. They are walking past the Pemberton Cemetery. That's the tomb. Must have cost him a lot of dough. Yeah, 10,000 bucks and heavy jack. Well, that's worth it. The tomb sort of gets you. Yeah? Well, don't you feel it? No, but uh, it gives me an idea. What kind of an idea? Do you know where this guy Fawkes lives? Yeah, he's got a farmhouse down near Brown's Mill. He must have plenty of dough in that house. What do you mean? You can figure it out. Yeah, yeah, I get it now. now what do you say? Well, this might be dangerous. Oh, it's a pipe. He's an old man. Yeah, well... Okay. And if he fights, that tomb won't be empty very long. That night, Camden, New Jersey police received a telephone call. Hello, police. This is Frank Fox calling. My brother, Bruni E. Fox, has been murdered. You better come down here to Brown's Mills right away. Police quickly arrive on the scene, and together with Frank Fox, the brother of the wealthy murdered man, make a thorough examination. Then, as they fill out the report... I found him here when I came to visit him this morning. Go on. Well, there isn't much more to tell except that a lot of his money was gone. Because I told Goldie not to carry so much cash around. How old was he? My brother was just turned 74. Well, I guess you'll take care of the funeral arrangements. Yes. I'll have to put him in that tomb he built. You know... Yeah? I was thinking... Maybe he shouldn't have built that tomb so soon. What do you think?
father further revealed that the elderly man had been robbed on two previous occasions. Police are of the opinion that the $10,000 mausoleum was an advertisement and invitation for underworld characters. Berlin, Germany. The night before election in Berlin saw a turmoil of activity. In a Hitler Youth Organization, a special meeting is called. Fellow Nazis, we have special orders from the party that must be carried out at tomorrow's election. We have been trusted with one of the greatest, most important, in fact, I might say the most vital activity of the entire election. What must we do? Make noise, but not just the ordinary noise. Our noise must be true Aryan noise. Strong, untiring, loud, continuous, and intense. Senor Nazi, what is the purpose of all this noise? The purpose? Why, to keep people awake, of course. Therefore, we will start early in the morning. At 5.30, that is the time. You must all be fully armed and ready so that we can make everybody off. What can we armed with? Horns, cowbells, sirens, missiles, and even blank pistols. When does the noise stop? At 9 in the evening. No one must fail. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! That same evening, the stormtroopers also held a meeting. The brown shirts lined up in military formation. Here are their orders. You will organize into flying squadrons of five men per squadron. You will call it the home of every voter, not once, but once every hour. Any voter who has not cast his ballot by one o'clock in the afternoon must be reported to the central office. He will be dealt with accordingly. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! In the German Army Air Corps. Every aviator in the army will go aloft at tomorrow's election on drop pamphlets from the sky. The heavens shall be black with our pamphlets. Heil Hitler! Election day dawned with a warm spring sunshine and in the home of a certain Berlin family. What time is it? Oh, it's healthy. Oh, it is good to stay in bed. Ah, it is election day. Yeah, you can sleep a little longer. You don't have to work today. Yeah, yeah, that is good. Oh, but who comes so early in the morning? And what do they want? You go to the window and drive them away, you go. Yeah, yeah, I will do that. Cody! Go away! Get out and vote! Leave me alone. I want to sleep. By 8 o'clock in the morning, it was absolutely impossible to sleep in Berlin. German bands were parading in the streets. The Hitler youth were making noise with tremendous enthusiasm. Stormtroop squadrons swung into action, ringing doorbells and demanding people rise from their beds. Hundreds of airplanes swooped low over the streets, dropping pamphlets. Two giant Zeppelins roared low over Berlin, with enormous loudspeakers blasting propaganda and playing jazz records. In short, the day from dawn to sunset was the greatest example of organized hysteria Europe has ever seen. By 7 o'clock in the evening, two members of the Hitler Youth are returning home. Oh, what a day this has been. Oh, such a day. How do you feel? I have a terrible headache. Uh, so have I. Heil Hitler. Uh, Heil Hitler. The results of the noise campaign indicated a 99% vote of approval for Hitler. All ballots not approving of Hitler were stamped in ballots. In all, 44,954,937 votes were cast. 542,898 voters said no. in New Jersey. Behind the bars of the death house in the very shadow of the electric chair, Bruno Richard Hoffman sits in his cell, hearing the ticking seconds of the prison clock crowd all too rapidly toward the moment when the state shall demand his right. As the condemned man sits and listens, Hoffman. Yeah? Your wife to see you. Anna? I let her in. Anna. How is the child? He is dead. And you. I am still alive. Yeah. What do they say outside? They say this is my last visit. Mm, what do you think? It is not so, Richard. You are innocent. We will be together many, many years. Yeah. Listen. You hear that clock? <laughs> But 
But in Brooklyn's Sheepshead Bay neighborhood, it is alleged a weird drama takes place. One Paul Wendell, his hands tied behind him, faces a group of men. Oh, please don't hit me again. You've got to confess. I didn't do it. Confess. No. Confess. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. Confess. No, no please. Confess. No, no. Confess. All right, then I confess. I murdered the Lindbergh baby. <laughs> This, according to the testimony of Paul Wendell, debarred New Jersey lawyer, is how the state obtained a confession that he murdered the Lindbergh child. The man's confession is turned over to authorities, and he is arrested for murder. In his cell, he is questioned by Attorney General Willen. I was beaten and tortured into signing this confession. Later, I signed another confession. My friend, Ellis Parker, told me to do that. What did Parker say? He said there was a million dollars in it if I confessed. Were you promised protection? Sure. I was told I'd be tried by the right people. What does he mean by that? Well, he said Colonel Schwarzkopf and Prosecutor Hauk would be removed. I tell you, my confessions were false. I don't know a thing about the kidnapping. Meanwhile, in the federal penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas, Gaston B. Means, ex-Secret Service operator and convicted swindler, signs an 18-page confession. I absolve Bruno Richard Hauptman for the murder of the Lindbergh child. I, Gaston B. Means, murdered the child. I was the mastermind of the whole plot. I was aided in the murder by a woman. I was aided in the kidnap plot by Max Hassel and Max Greenberg. I committed the crime at the behest of a relative of Mrs. Lindbergh. I have since found out that this relative was mentally unbalanced. Both Max Hassel and Max Greenberg are now dead. They were in life racketeers and gunmen operating in New Jersey. But in Trenton, despite the wild excitement and semi-hysteria that has affected the entire town, speculation as to the political outcome of the recent events runs riot. Only three men remain entirely calm. One is the man who... How much is this suit of clothes? Ten dollars. Here you are. Well, who are the clothes for? They're not your size. They're for Bruno Richard Hoffman. These are the clothes he will be buried in. In a saloon near the prison, a bartender addresses the second man who is connected with the case, but remains stoically calm. Here's your beer. Right. Well, tomorrow you'll probably bury Bruno Richard Hoffman. I hope so. You think he's guilty? I don't know. Oh, well, what do you hope so, then? Oh, well, I haven't given me the official commission as undertaker yet. I see. Well, I wish you luck. Thanks. Couldn't you tell me how it would feel? Hey, this is good beer. Give me another glass. The third completely calm individual in Trenton today is the prison electrician. With his assistant, he checks the electric chair. How does it look to you? All the connections seem to be okay. Yeah. There's only one wire leading to the chair. That simplifies matters. You want to make the test? Yeah. I'll go to the switch. Are you ready? Yeah. Go to the switch. How's that? Give it more juice. Okay. In the cell of Bruno Richard Hoffman, the light grew dim. The good news from Buffalo. Remington Rand, world's largest manufacturers of office equipment and typewriters, have set aside a limited number of Remington noiseless portable typewriters for rental use. How much do they cost? If you would like to rent it, send us $2 for three weeks. $2? What must I do? Simply write a card to Remington Rand, Buffalo, New York, and say, I want to rent a Remington Rand noiseless portable typewriter. Besides this unusual offer, you will receive 10 full days of free rental. Thus, you receive one of the finest typewriters in the world for 10 days, free of charge, or if you desire to rent it for any length of time, you may do so by paying a small fee of $2 for three weeks. All you have to do is to send the card to Remington Rand, Buffalo, New York. All you have to say is, I want to rent a Remington Rand noiseless portable typewriter. If for any reason whatsoever you are dissatisfied, send back the machine at our expense. There are only a limited number of typewriters available, so write to Remington Rand, Buffalo, New York tonight. <laughs> Five nights a week at 8.15 and Sunday nights at 9, Five Star Final presents this dramatic resume of the news of the day. For further details of tonight's dramatization, read your local newspapers. This is Garnett Marks saying good night for Remington Rand. This is an intercity presentation.
and this music have meant to millions of Americans a welcome visit from two beloved personalities. In fact, through the seasons, Amos and Andy have become more than personalities. They are real people. On this occasion, we present Mr. Lennox R. Lohr, the president of the National Broadcasting Company, who will bring a special greeting to them. Mr. Lohr. On the eve of the 10th anniversary of the National Broadcasting Company, it is a pleasure to salute Amos and Andy, who for seven years of that period have played a leading role in making our two networks famous. My early appreciation of this outstanding program has quickened into personal interest through association with Amos and Andy at a century of progress Chicago, where the Skyride Towers were dedicated to them. As this program now commences its eighth year, the National Broadcasting Company takes pride in recognizing the achievements of Amos and Andy. It is to these pioneers and friends of long standing that we give our congratulations tonight and our appreciation of the many pleasant hours we have spent together. We take you now to Amos and Andy in Hollywood with the hope that this program tonight is only an early milestone on a long road of happy birthdays ahead. Today, Amos and Andy drove their taxi cab up in the mountains to Lake Arrowhead. They decided to explore that section of the country. And after driving for almost an hour, they found themselves lost. By mistake, they turned on a narrow dirt road, and unfortunately, the car stopped out of gasoline. As the scene opens now, we find the boys walking down the road about 100 yards from their taxi cab, headed for a modest farmhouse to use the telephone. Here they are. Well, I didn't know that we was out of gasoline. We must have a leak in the tank or something. Yeah, where in the world is it? Well, I don't know where we are. We are somewhere up near Lake Arrowhead, up in the mountains. That's all I know. Well, how did we ever get on this road we was on? Well, you was the one that told me to turn down this road. Yeah, this ain't a mess. I don't know. Here we is, a hundred miles away from Los Angeles, up in the mountains. Then lost our way, and we're out of gasoline. I can see us sleeping in this taxi cab up here now. I'm walking my feet off to get some gas. Well, the thing for us to do is to go to this house down here. I asked the man let us use the telephone. And don't forget, if somebody brings us some gasoline out here, it's going to cost us plenty of money. Well, if the man would let us use the telephone, we just got to call up the nearest filling station and ask them to send it out and pay them whatever they want to charge us. Unless we want to walk to the nearest place and get it, but that might be miles away from here. Well, here's the house. Yeah, there's the man's mailbox with his name on it. What does that spell? Stay on the mailbox, W-A-L-T-E-R-H-U-S-T-O-N. W-A-L-T-E-R-H-U-S-T-O-N. Yeah. Well, let's get on in there and ask them. Yeah, I guess it's all right if we go up to the front door, Ann. Yeah, there's a lady over there working in the garden here. Yeah, well, come on, let's go up there. If he wants us to pay him for using the telephone, let's pay him. Yeah, well, go ahead, go ahead, knock on the front door. Well, come on with me, walk up on the porch with me, and don't start talking big enough now when you see him. Well, you do all the talking if you want. <laughs> this thing is running out of gasoline this far from home yet yeah, is bad. Yeah, well, wait a minute. I hear somebody coming. How do you do? Uh, how you do, sir? Uh, how you do, sir? Uh, Mr., uh, 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 could we use your telephone, please, sir? Well, I'm very sorry, but I don't have a telephone. Oh. Oh, you ain't got none, huh? No, is there anything wrong? Could I be of any assistance to you? Well, we got on this road out there in front of your house, and we run out of gasoline, and we was going to phone to the train station or something. We didn't see no automobiles going by, you see. Uh, we kind of lost, mister. I guess we can walk to the filling station, though, if you tell us which way the nearest one is. Well, the nearest filling station, boys, is quite a long ways. But I, I think I could let you have a little gasoline. Yeah, sir, but we'll pay you for it. Oh, that's all right. Let's walk out here and go around in the back. Yeah, sir, well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Where are you boys from, Los Angeles? Well, we is uh, from New York. Well, we drove uh, out from New York to Hollywood on our vacation with a trailer. We left the trailer in Hollywood, and we drove up there to Lake Arrowhead over there. And I don't know, we started messing around up here, and we got lost. And run out of gasoline. Well, that's too bad, boys. Now, let's see, what have we here? Mm. Ah, here's some gasoline. You boys don't have a can or anything, do you? I know, so we ain't got nothing, but we look around and see if we can find something. Yeah. Oh, here's one you can have. Yeah, hey, you can keep this. Well, uh, this show is nice of you, mister. Yeah, sir, we won't pay you for Oh, no, that's all right. I do forget about that. Sit down there. <clears throat> There's a little bench there that I keep out here. 
And this can of hose, now let's see, about, uh, about three gallons. I'll fill it up for you. Oh, no, sir, we don't need that much. Uh, that's all right. I've got plenty of gasoline. Now, here's a funnel. The boys are a long way from home. Yes, sir. That, that's a bad feeling, too. How would you like to have a sandwich before you go? Well, uh... Oh, no, thank you, sir. We just had something to eat while ago. Oh. oh, that's plenty of gasoline there. Ain't no use filling No, 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 that's all right. I might just as well fill it up. It sure was nice, sir. We didn't want to bother you. We just wanted to use your telephone, and yours was the only house that we could see around here. Well, there's, uh, there's three gallons of gasoline you can have. I wish you'd let me pay you for this. Oh, no, 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 that's all right. Maybe someday I'll run out of gas leave in front of your place. <laughs> and, and I'll call on you and you can pay me back, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, how come you live up here in the mountains by yourself? Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Move over there. Yes, sir. I'll sit down with you in a minute. Sit down, young fella. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. Uh, you live up here alone, huh? How come? Well, no, I don't live alone. I live here with my wife part of the year. She's out there in the garden now. Yes, sir. You see, I'm in a business that, well, it, it's a sort of a nerve, it's sort of nerve-wracking. But when I'm working, it, it feels like I'm on a merry-go-round. Uh, uh, you work in Los Angeles or Hollywood or someplace? Yes, like I've worked in Hollywood quite a bit. I've worked in New York quite a bit, too, in Chicago. When I finish my work, well, I, I just have a feeling that I'd like to get away. So I come up here and enjoy this little place. Yes. Just the two of you, huh? Yes, you know, I find that if a man will get away from his work part of the time, just think without the turmoil of worry and going here and there, well, it does you a lot of good. Yeah, that rest do anybody good. That's what I preach all the time. Yes, but you can't rest too much. But after you hit the ball and work night and day, well, it's nice to get away. Yeah, the man got to have some rest already, doesn't yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And a lot of them think, though, that they don't need it. But when I work, I work pretty hard. Now, I've seen some of my friends try to keep going, and I've seen them crack, crack under the strain. You know, boys, when I come up here, I find that I can think better. I get something out of life that I didn't know existed. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, that Hollywood is a busy place, all right. Yes, Hollywood is a busy place. And I guess a lot of people think it's sort of a playground. But a lot of people work awfully hard in Hollywood, and I've seen them, I've seen the work there drive them almost insane. Yeah, that moving picture business is a tough business. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. I guess when a man, or some of them people down there, them actors and all that, in the moving picture business, or when they get on the stage and stuff, they are under a strain then. That is a strain. Well, you know, I don't know that there's any other business that takes up 24 hours of a man's time every day when he's working. But, boys, this little place up here, well, I think every man in his heart would like to come to such a place someday and spend some time. Of course, some people... Might not like the dead silence of the night or the quietness of the day, but I love it. Yes, sir, I love it. Yes, sir, well, let us we get going now. You say I can have this can? Oh, I guess. Keep that. Throw it away when you're finished with it. Uh, well, we show sure appreciate it. Yes, sir, we let us pay you for this. No, 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 no. I've been paid by talking to you. I'm kind of glad you dropped in. Yes, sir, well, we sure was lucky, all right. And before we go, I want to tell you how much to, to thank you for giving us the gasoline and... It's three of us a long walk already. Right? Bye, boys. Well, good luck to you. Yeah, good luck to you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Is we lucky? I see we are. You know, he's one of the nicest fellows I ever met in my life. He'll see us kind of made you feel at home, didn't he? He sure did. Uh -huh. Nice place he got you, too. Yeah, there's the mailbox. What'd that say on there again? W-A-L-T-E-R-H-U-S-T-O-N. Nice fellow, wasn't he? He sure was. The character of Walter Houston was played by Mr. Walter Houston himself. Amos and Andy would like to extend their sincere appreciation for his kindness in appearing on the program tonight. On this, the first night of Amos and Andy's eighth year on the air for Pepsodent Products, the Pepsodent Company wishes to express its gratitude and appreciation for the loyalty and fine showmanship of these two boys. May we, on behalf of you, the Amos and Andy audience, salute them with cordial good wishes for their continued success. And now, I know that Mr. Houston would be happy to say a few words to the Amos and Andy listeners at this time. Mr. Houston. Thank you. <clears throat> Friends, first I want to tell you that it has been a great pleasure for me to work with the two boys whom I have listened to for many years. Whenever the opportunity presents itself, I invariably listen to Amos and Andy. 
This is our anniversary, the starting of our eighth year on the network. I have read the biography. Many of you know this. But for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the facts, here they are. These boys started working with colored dialect in January 1926. Under the name of Sam and Henry, this program, which was similar to Amos and Andy, was broadcast in the early days of radio over WGN in Chicago. After two years of Sam and Henry, the boys changed their names to Amos and Andy. In other words, Amos and Andy was actually started in March 1928. They broadcast at that time over station WMAQ in Chicago, with additional stations added by means of electrical transcription. But it was seven years ago tonight that they started on what might be called the big time. As you all know, they have established a record in radio broadcasting. They have received today many congratulatory messages from people in every walk of life. They deserve it. Tonight's episode, in which I had the pleasure of participating, was their 2,395th day of broadcast. As you know, the boys broadcast twice each day. I think these boys should be congratulated on their long record of daily broadcasting of these episodes which carries with it a streak of not only human interest, but of philosophy, which I have often enjoyed myself. These humorous, their humorous episodes have been a joy to many people for an awful long time. I congratulate these boys not only upon their ability to impersonate these characters, all of which they do themselves, but for writing this material each day. They are seated by me now, squirming in their chairs, and I'm going to ask them to say just a few words. It has been a pleasure to have had the opportunity of talking to you. I thank you. Here they are, Ames and Andy. Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Houston, and it's certainly nice of you to say all those sweet things. Yeah, even me, I was blushing. It ain't nobody ever heard me blush on the radio. Well, our program is almost up. We just want to tell our listeners how grateful we are to have passed another milestone in radio broadcasting. We've been grateful to the cooperation we've received here in Hollywood. We want to thank Major Law for his kindness, the Pepsi and Company for their nice message, Mr. Houston for his cordial greeting. And we want to tell you how grateful we are to you listeners who make these anniversaries possible. We want to thank you and tell you we are very, very thrilled tonight and say good night. Good night, folks. Broadcasting Company.